All right, how you guys been? Good, good, good. How you guys been? It's been a hot minute since we talked, Ricky. Yeah, it's been a long time. Actually, not that long ago. Not that long ago. Yeah, I feel like it was pretty recently. Dude, you you turned it into a freaking co-host at this point. Oh, honestly, I might take that job. You, uh, this is, how many episodes have you been on now? Is this four? This is three. This is four. Yeah, this is four. Dog, dog, this is crazy because, um, there was a point in time when, like, in terms of repeat guests, Mm. shit, man, it was a big deal to have someone on twice, three times, and then, like, the last four months, you've been on four times, um, I remember I was introduced to you basically at the Worlds in Sweden. Is right. when is when I was like, oh shit, what the hell's going on here? And yeah. um, and then ever since, and everybody's like, oh, you're all over the seventy four kilo boys, right? Man, right. I get my I get my balls busted for the seventy four kilo coverage like crazy. Yeah, but it's so interesting though. And when you first had me on um, six months ago, right when Worlds was uh, around the corner, actually slightly after Worlds, um, like my following count at that point was I think like. A thousand, a thousand five hundred, and then since that point in time, I started like just a huge upward trend, right? Because people started realizing, oh, this guy is like an asshole of like, Instagram. <laughs> he's, he's like the interesting <laughs> asshole that I follow, but I still don't like. And um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's definitely it's been a trip. It's well, been a great trip. Here's so, the thing: if you, because um, powerlifting sometimes it's like not that everyone has to have a personality. Like, mm-hmm. I, I mean, everyone has a personality, but not that everyone has to be anything other than themselves, right? But you naturally, like, you like being, like, joking, busting people's chops. Um, you'll state your beliefs on things and throw yourself in the mix. You're not afraid to throw yourself in the mix. And yeah. uh, for powerlifting, man, I mean, there's a lot of people who'd rather lay in the cut. There's a lot of people who, and I, whatever, it is what it is, but there's a lot of people who prefer, if a big competition's rolling up, I prefer not to even be on that podcast if you don't mind. I'll come in afterwards, but leading mm-hmm. up to it, I don't want to be on that podcast. Things like that, which for me, whatever, do do what you got to do get yourself mental. But you were like, yeah, oh, hell yeah. I'm in my element. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. It's, isn't it crazy how four months can change? I, I, like, I shit you not, when, we, when I sat down in Sweden and um, Joe Stanek was, who now is your coach, uh, mm-hmm. who at the time he was sitting into co host and he sat down and um, I was like, what what session do you want to be co-commentary for? And he goes, oh, the 74 kilo juniors for sure. So, oh, mm-hmm. for sure. Like, oh, really? Like, why is that? And I wasn't totally, there, there's, there's a shitload of sessions. I know the, the open, the juniors and masses, man, I don't know as much on point. And he's like, mm-hmm. oh, man. And he told me the background. And you guys lived up to the hype and more. And I was like, oh, snap. Um, after that, as soon as it happened, like, I got to get Ricky, I got to get Ricky on, I got to get Michael on, and I was all over the 74 kilo boys after that. Yeah. And, um, I had you both on. I had you both hey, on. Yeah, it was such a good time. You know what's funny, though, is um, I remember meeting you for the first time uh, before Michael and I competed. Um, I think it was like one or two days before, and I actually, I was there when Joe was talking to me and kind of hyping me up for you. And, and the look that you had on your face was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, buddy. Like we'll see what happens, right? And then, and then, obviously, uh, as the competition proceeded, I, I heard your commentary, and um, it was amazing, by the way. But oh, the uh, the level of uh, excitement in your voice definitely grew after you kind of saw the um, rivalry between me, and Michael, and like how how um, uh, I guess like the level of our uh, powerlifting skill compared to the um, the other roster. Oh, dude, it was in terms of dramatics. You guys like tossed around a world record back and forth like a volleyball. And then it was, it's more than just like, it's also the presence when you hit the platform and you were like uber confident. Like you, you even like, look, it doesn't, I don't even care win, lose or draw. Some guys can command that, right? If they're like in their element, even like, and look, it wasn't just after when you guys left Sweden and I was like, obviously very impressed. I was like, man, I gotta get both these guys on the podcast and I'm reposting like, like a motherfucker. Um, when we got back, leading into U.S. Raw Nationals, even like throw in Austin Perkins, my man is like personality. You see him on the platform, the way he does his, undoes his belt and backs away like a bike drop every time he hits a deadlift. And like, 
you know, you got Taylor who's like uber excited when he hits a he hits a big squat and he's yelling and the crowd's going crazy. Mm-hmm. Like you guys just like was the perfect storm, man. And so I'm glad, like I'm glad. First off, you're getting the attention you deserve, and you, it's your personality on the podcast. You've been doing other podcasts too. I'm not surprised. Once people heard like that podcast you came on, everybody and you were you were hyping it too on your social media. Everyone <laughs> heard it, and I was getting DMs. And I think other people heard it. I'm like, shit, I got to get him on my podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been on quite a few since then. And honestly, it's all thanks to you. But um, Well, no, uh, your personality, but I'll, I'll help people see your personality. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I, I guess it's both. But really, um, yeah, hopefully it's just an upward trend from here. And I'm probably going to keep doing the same thing. And um, hopefully the other guys do the same thing as well, keeping it uh, a little less dry, even though it's been kind of dry right now. But, you know. It comes and goes, doesn't it? Speak, hey, man, that dry is the perfect fucking segue, Ricky. Look at you. Yeah. Perfect segue for water cutting. And <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look at this. Oh. Look at my oh. man. You really <laughs> have been doing podcasts. <laughs> you, oh, man. Speaking of dry, <laughs> we, get, we get into the water cutting. <laughs> you know, you make it sound like I actually planned that, but you know, you know, I'll take the credit anyway. It's you, fine. you got a list of all your impromptu remarks you're going to drop for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, let, let's introduce you, uh, Kendrick, because your resume, when I posted, people were like, oh, shit, my man's has got a resume on him. Um, so let people know your background, and uh, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, no problem at all. I mean, it's funny to talk about the resume, just because when, when I reposted your post, my, my youngest brother was like 17 years old and had zero idea what politics is. He's like, oh my gosh, you made it. I was like, why, why would you say that? Because he has, he has no idea whatsoever on anything related to powerlifting or king of the lift, whatever. He's like, oh, you know, just looking at your resume, it's like, that's pretty impressive. Said, yeah, it's not too bad, right? I'm trying to be like a little bit humble <laughs> with my younger brother and stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, I would say my background is in terms of like education background is predominantly uh, nutrition. So I did my master's in sports and exercise nutrition. Uh, in London, now I'm doing my PhD in AUT, which is in New Zealand, uh, way, way ahead of you guys. It's actually like freaking almost 1 p.m. Sunday now, which is... Oh, yeah. damn, right now? You Are you in New yeah. Zealand right now? Sorry? You're in New Zealand right now? Yeah. Oh, so, it's 1 yeah, o'clock I'm... in the morning? No, 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 no. PM, PM. Uh, in the oh, afternoon. Okay. Yeah, can you imagine this guy? I was going to say, <laughs> my man, you were way too accommodating. <laughs> when we told yeah, you at yeah. time, Kendrick's like, I, I am going to make it happen, whatever. Wake me up. <laughs> He's, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Good, whatever. If that's the best, my man. Okay, mm-hmm. one, gotcha, all right. Yeah, so, like, I'm literally in the future. So, if Austin Sutton says he's the future, that's not true. I am the future Ooh, because wow. I am in the future. Oh, literally, wow. right? I am Sunday. You guys are still on Saturday. Uh, and yeah, my background, uh, I'm doing my PhD primarily looking at rapid weight loss, rapid weight cutting in strength athletes, which is uh, powerlifting mainly because that's a sport that I practice and closer to my heart. But uh, so in terms of coaching, it's funny you would say that I'm like accommodating in terms of time because when I, I started with the strength guys as an intern and Jason and Ben used to have their calls at 5 a.m. in the morning and like Ben as well was really impressed when I first started because he said this guy has made all our calls like on the past six calls which means like six weeks or 5 a.m. morning on a Saturday morning as well which means that I don't get my weekend sleep in because I wake up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. depending on daylight savings or not uh, to, 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 to make the calls right so yeah. I started off with the strength guys as an intern uh, very much uh, at the end of my master's thesis, so that's like around two years ago, and I would say just slowly, slowly getting in the group. I mean, my background is in nutrition, but I do have like uh, background in like programming and strength training and stuff, but it's not a formal education background. So, I mean, with the strength guys, I, I learned a lot, but obviously, uh, Jason used uh, my formal education background and pushed me as like the nutrition phase because we didn't have uh, much of like a, a, like a real nutritionist on the team. And it, I think it started in 2018 when I went to World in Calgary and I started doing a survey for my PhD in terms of how to do weight cuts for powerlifting. And at that point, I had zero clue 
uh, whatsoever. But as people come started coming to me and well, Jason, uh, Jason and his mom said that, oh, you know, if you want to do weight cut, Kendrick's about to do his PhD, so you can call him Dr. Weight Cut, which I found like, oh, you know, that, that, that's a pretty good name. But at that point, I, I literally had like zero clue. That was like my, my entrance into the whole like rapid weight cutting uh, field. And as more and more uh, athletes inquire about like weight cuts and stuff, then Jason sent them to me. And the, the higher caliber the athlete is, I feel like that's a pressure for me to deliver. So I, I started looking deeper and deeper into it. And fast forward a year, I'm literally doing a PhD looking at stuff like that. So, See, here's, uh, the thing. Oh, here's the thing with the strength guys, man. It feels like, because I had Chad Dolan on. I was going to have uh, Jason Trombley on for the preview show for the European Championship. And he's like, I can't make it. Super sick. I'm going to have Chad on. And my man also has like a freaking PhD and was going through his background. I'm like, to get on the strength guys, you got to be like a doctor. What kind of, this is a highly, this is, this is a tough vetting process to join this outfit. But it feels like everybody's got some crazy background on them. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's always good to have like a big like, uh, like background and like alphabet soup titles behind your name that, that, that that's always nice right but i think like even for the other people like alfred as alfred here he doesn't have like a phd but he's like men's coaching background being a competitive athlete that's like in taekwondo almost going to like the olympics hey, Kendrick, you're a little bit crackly do you, you're a little crack do you hear that ricky on your end yeah yeah i can hear it i it just might be that phone so yeah, yeah. Right. talk is, now is it is it better right like that it's a little better what, what, what do you what do you think it would sound like if you just took off the headphones and did a uh, based on the speaker? You think it would be really weird? We could try it. Just so there's right. like sometimes oh. feed, there's like a, a feedback loop. But we could try. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh yeah, my mistake. I can't even hear you now. Try try. <laughs> did you unplug the headphones? Yeah. If your computer has a mic, it should be able to work. If not, my bad. I can I, I can't unplug my earphones. I think it sounds better. Oh, that sounds hundred percent better. Yeah, it sounds okay. Yeah, perfectly fine. Cool. It, yeah. yeah, it might be a matter of every now and then we gotta grab that mic on your earphone. Is that where yeah, your mic is on your earphone? Up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there we go, man. <laughs> so I, I just I just put it close to my mouth. There you go. There you go. Um. So yeah. So and, and you also ended up. How did you end up working with Taylor? You work with Taylor as well, right? For nutrition. Yeah, I, I think that was really like the big, like I got a lot of clout doing that for, for Taylor. I mean, Taylor is popular for obvious reasons, uh, but it, it actually started in, I think, Calgary. So when I was working with the strength guys, uh, my role to help Taylor was just to monitor his like readiness and stuff and whatever, you know, so I started working with Taylor from that point, looking at his readiness, how he responds. Uh, he responded to training, and based on that, I'll, every week I'll write a report, send it to Jason, and Jason and Ben would consider what I say, and then take it into account when they program the following week. Uh, but I think it came to, uh, I, don't know, some, I can't remember which meet, but they was like, oh, you know, like Taylor's a bit like heavy now, uh, and yeah, you, you've been doing weight cuts for a lot of people, you, uh, with like, I think my first sort of like big name from the strength guys was Rob Ali, did a weight cut it which way 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 and it's super easy uh and stuff so yeah they they taylor said oh, all right i understand so uh they said right this is the year taylor uh you can pick your team whoever you want to dispose of from the strength guys and the taylor said yeah you know uh, let's get kendrick on as my nutritionist so how he just sort of like he picked me how and many, then how many people has taylor got you, you when you say pick your team now i'm interested ricky's probably thinking hold the shit how many does this dude got like 25 people on him? That's like, exactly, I was gonna bring that up because this guy sounds like he, he got like an NFL contract. He's like, he's like ready to play, right? He has his like 10 doctors, 10 everything on the side, this, right? This dude, it must be nice to be the king. This is how the king yeah, lives. Must be right? nice, right? <laughs> yeah. He's got a social media manager. He's got, how many people are on Taylor's team? I think, right, I mean, when, when Jason said pick your team, he said, like, you can pick any coach from the strength guys. So I think right now it's Jason, Ben, uh, myself, and our resident, like, in-house physio, like, Jacob Templer. So it's just the four of us right now. And, yeah. 
so at that point, uh, literally like in a way, I would say like Taylor picked me to be like to help him with the, the weight cut. And I think the big part for me was to just evaluate and just basically my job is to annoy Taylor and like say, dude, I need your feedback. I need your feedback, man. I need yeah. your weight. Because obviously that, that guy is like super busy. Yeah. And, I mean, that guy's that guy's always busy. He works in like New York in like in a, like big company and stuff. So my job is like literally to annoy him all the time. And as much information he provides, I, I use that information to sort of like, okay, this is the based on what you're telling me. I think this is the best way to approach whatever we're doing. Uh, so that's how the relationship between Taylor and I works for like the nutrition coaching. Um, in terms of weight cut, because I talked about it previously, and it's kind of like the dark arts in terms of. There's so many people, A, who do it wrong, some people who dabble in this, mess it up, and end up, you know, totally being like, okay, I'm never going to do it again, when really they just mess up their own weight cut. Have a ter- you can, if you do it wrong, you can have an absolutely terrible experience. Your, your performance can go right out the window. You can feel like trash, and if you do it really wrong, it can actually be dangerous. Everyone's heard those horror stories of athletes, you know, I mean, whoever's in the sauna... With, with like a yeah, sweat suit on and do, in doing some kind of rowing machine and guys like wrestlers dying and whatnot. You know, it can get crazy. Um, I think actually now, Kendrick, you're actually breathing into the mic. <laughs> no, no worries. But, um, but like, so when it comes to weight cutting, it's, it's like the dark arts, getting it down right. You know what I mean? And um, for those, it's, it's almost like if you know how to do it properly, it's such an advantage on your, because you could be half a weight class up. And, and there's a reason why there's weight classes. Mass moves mass. The bigger you are, the more mass you can move. And um, so if you can weight cut properly, I mean, I saw a picture with Ricky and Michael in the warm up room backstage, and Ricky looks like he's another weight class bigger than this gentleman. You know, Ricky looks, Ricky's a, a big 74 kilo boy. And um, so I'm glad you guys are on here revealing, but do you, Ricky, are you somewhat like, ah, shit. I don't know. I got mixed feelings about this. No, I mean, I'm fine. At this point, I, uh, I'm i a strong believer that, you know, like the principles of water loading and manipulating your nutrients, um, you know, it's pretty basic. It's a lot of like foundational material, but uh, the, the ability to execute it and stay with that protocol and also, you know, kind of put your body through that level of stress. I don't really think that that's for everyone. Right. I think I might have a higher tolerance for something like that. So I'm not going to like keep information away from the masses rather, uh, you know, you, you guys can try it and see if you can get to like the level that I put it at. So hey, here's the thing, man, when you got the villain around, you could also spread a little misinformation. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As much saw as you want right that's, before a whale, right? right? So that's, that's a key. You know what? Okay. So there's, this is one of those topics. It, there's a lot to cover. Um, as, as somewhat simple as it might sound in terms of like, okay, water loading, salt loading, pulse sodium, some people do get it wrong. We've heard stories too. Like, yeah, I mean, top end guys. Sean Norea talked about, look, I think I got my salt wrong and um, it really messed me up. We heard stories about Michael C at the US Raw Nationals. I don't know. I mean, we don't, we'll never know if it was entirely just weight cut, somewhat weight cut. He also had to give blood for blood doping two days earlier. But there's, there's other scenarios that people have mess around with sodium mixing up and uh and we could talk a little bit about what you guys have heard in terms of misconceptions and what proper protocol might be and uh, also the rehydration phase and i know for a fact too some people in terms of cutting calories and saying what macros do i cut what macros hang on to water and what macros can i do away with because some people cut way too much cut way too much in terms of their carbs turn up the next day and be like, man, I haven't eaten in 24 hours, but I'm making weight. And they have a terrible day. And once again, they're like, weight cutting just isn't for me. When it's like, well, you might not have just done it properly. So I guess maybe maybe the best way to tackle this, what are some of the things, before we get into what you should do, what are some of the things that some people shouldn't do that you've heard and seen in terms of um, weight cutting, water loading, etc.? Ricky, do you want to go first? Uh, I'm actually curious about your opinion because I, I did talk about this in a previous podcast. Um, yeah. So I feel like you might bring a little bit more insight than I am, or I would. How yeah. there, buddy? Uh, I, I think the first part would really be to consider whether you should or shouldn't weight cut. That that right. So obviously, when you use weight cut, I think the term we, we have to define is like rapid weight cut, right? So 
we just use weight cut for, for the sake of uh, simplicity. But I think the first thing people should consider is that whether they should or shouldn't weight cut, you know, like most of the time, like powerlifters competing in their first meet, they're like, oh my gosh, should I weight cut? First of all, you already have the immense stress of your first competition. So you'd be really nervous and stuff because you've never stepped on the platform. And then on top of, on top of that, you like an additional stress of like, should I weight cut or not? All right. So I think when I, when I speak to people, at least uh, a lot of the athletes or in a way, just generally, a general recommendation that's like the first thing you should consider is that, hey, uh, what, what is the reason you're weight cutting for? Uh, do, do you actually have to do it? Because if you're going to a local meet, your first power clean meet, and this is your introduction to the sport, I would recommend you not to weight cut because not only will you have, will you have an ill taste of weight cutting if it goes wrong, uh, second is that you might not actually enjoy the sport at all. Like right? the, the guy that gets three out of nine on his first power clean meet, there's a, yeah, so yeah. there is a likelihood he won't come back to power You know what? Mm-hmm. You 100% it is not enjoyable. And if you're not, for your first few times, just have fun and get used to it. I think you're 100% right. And cortisol levels and all the rest of it, we can get into it. Do not help you release water when you're stressed. And yeah, if you're like, fuck, is this this the way the sport's going to be? It doesn't have to be that way. It is not an enjoyable process. Exactly. And another thing would be, one, uh, I I use this, uh, would be like, yeah, I look at the athlete's age. Because uh, that, that, that... so if an athlete gets the weight cut, right, then there's likelihood that, that they think that, yeah, you know, I got, I got it right the first time, so I can keep doing it, right? And usually if they are much higher, right, especially if they are juniors, right? So I always consider if you're a junior, it, it means that if you're a junior and you're like one kilo, I'm uh, one kilo, like let's say you compete in the 74, right? But you're at 73 kilos. There's a big likelihood that when you go to like the open, you're not going to get 74 kilos anymore. And at least if you think of putting on muscle mass and stuff like that, right? Because as, when you're a junior, you still have a uh, potential to grow, and that is like the prime time. So if someone constantly thinks of like, oh, I have to keep cutting weight, and you that could potentially, in the long term, impact their growth as, as an athlete because you're not feeding yourself with enough food or nutrients to support regular growth because you're constantly in a deficit. And then it, and you impose the, the weight cutting stress. And for some reasons, uh, junior athletes, they love competing like four or five times a year. I have no idea why, but uh, which means like it's a cycle, right? Multiple cycles throughout the year of like being in deficit, putting the stress of weight cutting. So I think in the, uh, in the grand scheme of things, a young athlete, I would uh, shy them away from weight cutting too frequently. And I would say, yeah, you know, maybe you should just go in the next club. You can in the long, long-term long game, especially if you're not, I'm, I'm not, maybe Ricky is different if you have a chance to break the world record, it's really different, but I say, dude, if you think yeah, in the yeah, long-term yeah. game, you know, you have to think long-term, you know, I'm not saying that you can't be competitive now, but I mean, if you want to do this just for one year, sure, I'll just give you the craziest stuff, but you know, you might not compete yeah. in the power of this thing next year again. Yeah, if you're a junior lifter and you're like Ricky, who's can compete in the open, can, you know, go after records, whatnot, all right, you should probably make the cuts to 74. But if you're a junior lifter, you're not in prime time. You're not going to Worlds. You're just a junior lifter looking to grow in the sport, which is like Ricky's the tip of the spear and, and you know, the other 74 kilo guys we had on this podcast. But let's say you're at the rest. You know, you're in the middle ground and you're thinking about cutting and you're you're a junior lifter. That's when you might be stunning your own growth. And it's yeah. more of those guys that you would be like, you know what, maybe work on your development. You're in a development phase. You're not at the tip of the yeah. spear yet. We're not talking. We're not talking about records yeah. or, or making qualifying for national teams yet. Let's just work on the other things. So after you've established that, um, and you're like, all right, let's say you're working with an individual who does want to start cutting. What, what are the, what are some of the protocols you look at there? Because I we've all heard those people who, I mean, in terms of like cutting like water loading, or, or cutting out water. How far out should they cut out water? And uh, I mean, I've heard we've heard some disaster stories, and I mean from like legitimate high-end people who go to the world championships, people not making weight, people just having terrible performances, etc. It really is like a fine art, and I don't know if they just fly on on their own or or they get bro science to do it. Um, but let's let's walk into let's say all right, the person wants to cut, and you agree they should cut. Well, what's some of the procedure we should do there? All right. Um, I- I say this all the time. I say you evaluate the starting point, right? If you are 
if you're three months out and you have 10 kilos to lose, you, you might actually not make it, right? So you have to face the reality. So you evaluate where your starting point is. Uh, after evaluating your starting point, and generally, uh, I would say, we try our best not to be in a deficit, uh, a gradual deficit for an extended period of time because that could potentially impact training. Uh, so what I, what I like to do is that if they're actually, I would say, I give a range of three to four percent, right? Uh, that's a safe range for most people. Some people would be able to push the high end of like uh, five to six percent, but some even higher. But I would generally three to four percent is a good start. And I would say, hey, you know, we, if you are, if this is your weight, three to four percent above your, your competition weight, let's keep your calories at maintenance so your weight doesn't fluctuate too much and you don't eat. Uh, I don't want to be dropping your weight because I don't want you to drop the calories and affect your training leading up the competition. Because I always look at nutrition as like the support, the support stuff to training, you know, the nutrition fuels your training because uh, whatever you eat, uh, in a way, should make you feel good when you train. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I think people like, you know, in, in the scientific community, community, people always say like, oh, new, nutrient timing doesn't really matter. I said, dude, when you're in a deficit, that's, a really deep deficit, you would see how important nutrient timing is. So, you, in a way, your, your window is like narrower, but when you are on the surplus or in maintenance, you have more calories, you can just like, yeah, I know I'm hungry before this, maybe I need more carbs, I need more food, I'll just eat it. But when you're in a deficit, you can't think of that. So, uh, that could potentially uh, impact your training. So, after, it establish, after establishing the range of weight they'll be in uh, and keeping in maintenance, Usually, the first protocol I would use, the, the two main protocols that I find impact performance uh, the least would be uh, reducing gut volume, which is changing the macronutrients of uh, the composition of the food in the gut. Uh, we can go more into detail after this and using some form of uh, water loading followed by water restriction protocol. You know, it's interesting you said people who say like uh, macro timing isn't as big a deal. I agree. When you're in a deficit, I remember I cut. I had a big cut one time because I turned. I was doing some like pieces Frank for charity. At one moment, I was on like Canada's Got Talent, America's Got Talent, doing some like crazy shit, like pulling planes, flipping cars. So I had to get big. Like you, I got big. Right? I was eating whatever I could eat, and then to cut back down, I was not six pack lab, but I put it that way. And, um, and to cut back down, I had like a thirty pound cut. We're talking like for our international friends, like 14 kilo or whatever, 13 kilo, whatever. And um, so it was a brutal cut. And to get through workouts, like, yeah, there are times when you were like, man, is my strength ever going to come back? My strength plummeted when I was in a deficit. And your body, when you're shedding pounds like that, your strength just goes way down. And um, then it becomes a little bit about, I know you mean, where a little ma macro time becomes a little bit more of a serious issue at that point where you're like, is there a point in the day when I can feel all right? Or is there a tough point today where I can at least move some things around just to get through? When you're eating in your maintenance and everything's all jolly and good, all right, you're not as worried about macro timing. I get it. But when you start cutting, it every penny counts when you're like yep. when it comes to your macros. So I 100% what you get what you said right there. Yeah, I think um, on that point, right with macronutrient timing, I think a lot of people know me from um, from my deadlifts when I black out, right? And, uh, you know, on that note, that's not even necessarily when I'm in a deficit, even at maintenance. Um, so I think that really shows the importance of blood sugar level and like blood pressure while you're working out. And this is especially more, um, more important when you're in a deficit, right? It, when you're eating less food, when you have less anything in your system, right? That, that those smaller, um, nuances of, uh, dieting, uh, such as timing your nutrition becomes ever so more important, uh, more important than, you know, if you were in a surplus. And, and, and it's, it's different for everybody when people don't realize too, like they hear someone talk like, Oh, you're, you're uh, whatever around the same body weight as me. At one point when I was walking like crazy, I was doing like uh, a cardio intensive sport, like jujitsu as well as weightlifting. And like, I got up to like stupid levels of, of calories I was intaking while maintaining being a buck 90. So what is that? 87 kilo range, 88 kilo range. And, and I was um, like, I mean, close to 5,000 calories. And if someone heard that and thought, oh, I'm around that size, I'm around that height, maybe 5,000 calories works for me. My friend, 
you might end up being, you know, 100 kilo 220 if you try 5,000 calories. Like, even if you did the exact same as me, like, it's very much different for everybody. That's why, you know, sometimes you could, uh, people get strength templates offline and think if you get a template for cutting, it'll be the same. And a strength template, if you're relatively new, you're probably going to get gains no matter what. Not as much if you got a coach, but it's not as dangerous, you know, especially if it's RPE, it, you'll probably get some gains. But if you're talking a cutting template or a cutting protocol that's just straight blanketed, man, that can get straight up dangerous, man. You, you like, if not dangerous, you for sure will impact and feel like shit. And, and just totally, you could ruin an amazing prep and then cut wrong and there goes your whole, you could PR every single week. Cut wrong, and there, there it all goes. Your day's going to be shit. That's where cutting is so, like, a fine art. And you really do need a coach if you don't know. If you don't know you yet, anyways. Um, and then, we haven't even got there yet. We're still the cutting parts. But then, after you've cut, you loaded the water, cut the water, and then rehydrating afterwards is another art, too. Because you get people who are just, yeah. like, they're nervous. They don't feel hungry. I've seen people like, nah, I'm not hungry. You know, it's like, I know you're not, well, no shit, you're not hungry. You're probably nervous as hell. You probably, it'd be really tough to consume anything, but you haven't had a calorie in God knows how long. And if you think you're going to be deadlifting a PR, you're going to have problems, man. But uh, we're skipping ahead a, a stitch here. Let's back it up. So we're, we're coaching these people. In terms of um, cutting and calorie, do you also, and Lane Norton, I think, for me at least, made it famous in terms of reverse dieting and actually conditioning you could cut further out and then actually ramp up calories and actually get their metabolism conditioned to consume more so you can actually be eating more leading into while keeping the body weight down. Maybe let's touch up on, I don't know if you do that a lot with your athletes, but can we touch up on a little bit about that idea? Because that's kind of what I had to do when I had to drop like 30 pounds. I was eating, so, like I had to slowly every week, another 100 calories, another 100 calories, two months later, I was, I kept the body weight off, but I was eating maybe not as much as I did when I was 100 kilo 220, but I was eating substantially more than when I was in the cutting phase, in the deficit phase, and I was feeling like total garbage. And that was a huge thing for me. Yeah, I, I think a big part of it, it really depends on the context. So when we look at like reverse dieting or even for recovery diet, which is uh, popularized by like Eric Helms and the crew from 3 dmj which I'm a little bit more inclined, not just because Eric Helms is my PhD supervisor, uh, but uh, it often caters a lot to like physique athletes, which probably have like 5% body fat, you know, on stage. And they're about, they look, they look like they're about to die, you know, they, they probably can't lift any weight at that point. Uh, so when we look at that, I, I think the, a big misconception is that people so think, oh, if I reverse diet, you know, I, my metabolism would get inflated. But the fact is that, one, your metabolism definitely would drop when you're, diet, when you're dieting just because you're lighter, you know? So for a guy that's 100 kilos versus myself, who is like, uh, right now I'm like 81, so the guy that's 100 kilos would have a higher metabolism or just daily energy expenditure just because he's heavier, you know? That it would be equivalent to me putting on a 20 kilo backpack and walking around because he is moving more mass with the same, let's say we take the same amount of steps today. And I think in, in the literature that there is uh, some data showing that when you are also in like uh, a massing or a bulking phase, your maintenance calories can be like 15% higher, you know? So 15% higher plus your daily energy expenditure from from the additional weight that they're carrying, that would increase metabolism and things like if you're eating more, uh, you like you just tend to be feel a little, a little bit more energetic compared to like when you're in, in the cut and your body just want to conserve that energy, so it just like makes you feel like oh, I just want to sit down all day uh, and not do anything. So all of that is a major factor when it comes to, to think about right. Your metabolism is affected by all of these factors. It's not just, oh, because I increase my calories slowly, my metabolism is rock high. Mm. So there is that, that artificial inflation of uh, your, 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 your BMR and the activity that, is, that you perform subconsciously when, you, when you're eating more. Uh, like, for example, I would say that when I'm, I notice this for myself as well, uh, I, that when I'm on the, 
top word, I fidget more when I sit around. Like that's just very like subconscious, you know. And versus when I'm on a deficit, sometimes very rare, but I just like I feel like a potato just sitting down, not doing anything, you know, things like that. So all of this would artificially increase uh, your metabolism, but that that range at least is not it's not a fixed range, you know. You could do it at the same time. You could go to the go to that range again, do a cut, and then do the exact same protocol. You might not reach that same number. So I would say the yeah. number really is um, it's a moving target. You know, it's not it's not a fixed one. So you have to identify right is the target moving around where what uh, where can I be within that moving range to achieve my goal. So. Uh, the, the, I think that is a big part when it comes, you know, when you say like a cutting template, because a cutting template, you just plug in your, your, your data, right? Your, your daily uh, energy expenditure, uh, no, sorry, your daily activity level, your weight, your height, and then they just spit out some, some like, right, in this amount of calories. But that could be very individual for like, for you, for Ricky, for myself, you know, even though it might be the same body weight, but I could say that the range should be huge, right? Some people would need less, some people would need more. And, I, I think that's when having a coach uh, actually helps. Yeah, the coach will identify, right, understand that it's a range. And then let's use the baseline, which is whatever calories there, and then that, that's given, and then we adjust according to how someone responds. It, two questions I got in, in, in regards to that. So what I experienced, this is anecdotal though, there's no, this is just for myself, what I felt. While I was cutting, and again, this was a big cut, we're not talking a few pounds here and there. Um, I was dropping 30 pounds. So I have, this is an extreme case. Um, but, but perhaps it, it, it's easier to gauge how you feel when it's extreme. While shrinking, I felt pretty hot garbage, man. Like, it was bad. Once I stopped, maintained, and chilled at the bottom of my body weight, and I was no longer shrinking, the body wasn't shrinking anymore, it started turning around for me. So I don't know if that's, um, like... Physically, the body, while shrinking, will start maintaining in terms of energy levels, and there might be a difference there, and that's very real. Uh, so I, I, I got a question regarding that, if that's actually the case, scientifically speaking. While you're shrinking, the body might conserve energy, thinking, I don't know, if it, especially if you're cutting a big cut like I was, uh, the body might think you're starving for guys like 30 pounds is quite a bit. And uh, secondly, with everything you said, is it possible to condition a metabolism like we condition a central nervous system to eat more after you've after you've cut and you've reached your target and you're like I'm gonna stay here um, or relatively speaking we you might still cut another five pounds of water but for my walking around weight I found my walking around weight I would like to consume a little more a little more calories coming in might help my recovery etc can you condition after you found your your resting rate so the two questions on the way down, when your body's got a pretty big cut, will it impact your strength? And does it level off once your body weight levels off? Does the strength return? And then the second follow-up, can you increase those calories and, uh, but keep your body weight low and condition your metabolism? Um, I, I, I would say, like to answer the first question, I would say the amount of strength uh, you lose based on if you're losing body weight, Depends on how much you cut, right? You you, you didn't say mass move mass, so if you're losing 30 pounds, the same weight on the on the bar when you squat is definitely not going to feel the same, you know. And this it affects the leverages as well, you know. Like people will say, that, oh, I lost my squat belly, I don't feel uh, uh, as strong as at the bottom of the hole, and it happens all the time. Especially if you look at the way bodybuilders prep, uh, maybe at the start, right, they would be able to squat, but they they transition more to like stuff like hack squat more leg presses, things that offer like artificial stability, just because at the whole, it feels really different, you know, mm. things like that. So, uh, and that could affect strength. So strength is, is a multifactorial thing. It's not just, uh, it's just not how much, how big your muscle is, how much you can contract, but when it comes to moving weight, like leverages stay a little as well. So the bigger you cut, then there's a possibility that it would affect leverages, uh, how the bar feels in your back, uh, things like that. So uh, I, that, I, I would think that, it depends on how much you cut, right? So that would impact the strength. As for like the second question, I, I think that it's quite hard to achieve uh, a similar like metabolism when you're much heavier in the sense that just by the fact that you're much lighter right now. So if you think about it, if you walk like 10,000 steps a day, right? And at 100 kilos, let's say you burn, uh, 
you, you, you burn like maybe like a thousand calories in total from that amount of fat. I mean, the numbers are just arbitrary. I'm just picking up numbers. When you're lighter, right, you're definitely going to burn like less. So let's say you, from 100 kilos, you drop to 80. So that's, that, that's like 20% loss. So maybe you might be burning 800 calories instead of 1,000. So that on its own, it's, it's really uh, hard to maintain that, that kind of metabolism because a big part of, uh, we call it like metabolic adaptation, right? This is a term that you really, uh, your, your need, right? Your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is all the involuntary movements that walking around, plays a big role in, in overall energy expenditure. So when we look at it from that point of view is that one, you're lighter, which means that the same amount of work you're putting in, you're burning less calories just because you're moving less body weight. Second is that when you're dieting, your body would try to conserve energy and make you move less. So mm -hmm. that would influence the need, which means that it's quite hard unless you're consciously trying to like increase your fat count, right? Maybe you could increase your fat count compared to the time when you were heavier or you put artificial weight on, for example, uh, like uh, Eric Lee, Salazar, which is, I think he recently won his toe cut. He, what, what he did was that uh, during his prep, he wears a weight vest 90% of the time. And when you lose weight, you will add like artificial weight, like to increase the weight on the weight vest to correspond to the weight he lost. So uh, technically he's walking around at the same body weight yeah, and yeah. keeping the energy expenditure high. So that is how he kept his like metabolism up, you know? Dude, is, so it possible, would... is it possible though? Um, so is reverse dieting real then in terms of can you increase slowly your calories a little bit? Like you, have you heard of this theory, Ricky? I got it from Lane Norton, but I don't want to misquote. Like Lane's been on the show, and if he and he if he listen to podcasts, I might be butchering what he said. And he's like, dude, that's not what the fuck I said. But I read, so, so forgive me. I'm not. But this is my realm. But um, have you guys heard where let's say all things be even? And I 100, percent I get what you're saying there, and it totally makes sense to me. The bigger you are, you go for the same distance walk as someone else smaller than you, you're going to burn more calories because you have to move more mass to do that walk. But let's say, um, let's take away all exercise and everything out of it. If you just have your metabolism, can you make it faster by slowly increasing in small increments every week more and more calories so your, body, your metabolism just adjusts slightly? It maintains that body weight and adjusts slightly. The next week, it maintains that body weight. That theory of reverse dieting and increasing your metabolism. Do you guys think that's legit? And have you heard? I don't. I, I don't know in terms of studies. I just read articles. I mean, I've heard of the concept. The reason I haven't been talking is because I'm absolutely not familiar enough to really place my own opinion on it. But that, yeah. personally, like the way that Kedrick is speaking about the subject, it kind of sounds like you're you're getting a hard no on that. Yeah, it sounds. That's why I'm asking. That's why um, I'm like, because I, 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 I anecdotally, like I did that, and I slowly increased every week, and, and I ended up eating more. But that doesn't mean there's so many other factors. And when it's one person. Maybe I was fidgeting more. Maybe I, like there's a, like like Kendrick said, a million other factors. So it's not scientific. You mm -hmm. need two hundred people to take out all the variables, and then you can see. But there are people who full on one hundred percent accept this as science that you can actually condition your metabolism through calorie consumption, small chunks of calorie consumption. Um, I'm just not the dude in terms. Of, I haven't read the studies. I read articles. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, I. I mean, it, it sounds like a hard note, right, for me, but I, I, I will always say that everything is, like, uh, there isn't, I mean, to quote Star Wars, like, only the Sith speaks in absolute, so I can't say this absolutely no, but I would say uh, for, for some individuals in my work, but I would say that for someone who is at maintenance and they're trying to increase their metabolism, you know, it, it, they, it, it's quite a long shot to say, like, right okay. now, like, at 4,000 calories, and I want to make my maintenance at 5,000, where I'm already at 4,000 maintenance, and I increase mm -hmm. bit by bit, I would say that it's not, I, I don't think that's possible, and I, and most of the people that use reverse dieting, they tend to be like, like, they, they lose a big amount of weight, right? A lot of weight. For someone who, like, lose, like, one, two kilos, I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't need the diet at all, but I would say that uh, when it comes to that increasing calories on its own isn't that is the concept right 
yeah. that, that is the way that, that is the concept but I don't think that that is the explanation and I think that saying that that on its own is the reason why my metabolism is up just by gradually in, increasing calories I think that's quite reductionist because I say that there are a host of other factors and eating is very uh, behavior driven by behavior and it could be vice versa your behavior could drive your eating and your eating could affect your behavior so mm. you know I would say that if you think that if you look at say oh if I increase my calories by 100 every single week my metabolism is going to go up for sure I would say that 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 could possibly be just a very reductionist mindset to have yeah so my dreams of being a 74 kilo boy who eats 5,000 calories <laughs> is gone. gone oh well that's why we <laughs> talk about it so much that's why <laughs> you're trying to be one of us I'm, okay. I'm trying to be one Man, so we you. got we got like the villain, we got Taylor, we got the future, and then we got the past right here. That's right, fine. So. I'm, like, I'm, I'm the ghost of Christmas past. I'm so sorry, dude. I'm, I'm the ghost. Yeah, you set it up for yourself, right I'm there. The, I'm the ghost of Christmas past, man. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. Oh, but, uh, so, so oh, I feel bad. It's all good. So if if all right, so in terms of calories, basically we're we're, we're attacking the myth in terms of reverse calorie or uh, reverse dieting, increasing calories. Um, it's mostly activity and then recognizing that the smaller you are, the more activity you're going to need because the bigger you are, the less activity you need because you're moving around more weight for every single step you take, um, every time you fidget, etc. Just to make the same dis- distance when you're bigger, you're going to burn more calories. So that sounds good. So there's a battle plan right there for getting down. Let's say you're within range that you get to, that you need. You're cutting to 74 and you're within three, four percent. You were saying some people might be able to cut five percent body weight, six percent body weight. Some people, I mean, it's going to vary, vary there. Um, what are some of the protocols you would say? Now we're getting less into calorie restriction and more into the water cut. So we're talking water loading, sodium, the cut it there, and we can also talk. I don't know if. If there has been studies about why certain people it affects differently, because some people can be the exact same body size, the water load the exact same, and and sodium as well, and do the exact same procedure and not get the same results. And um, I don't know if we know why, if there's certain, or if it's just looking at its variables and you just gotta figure it out by doing. You, I mean, we can and I might, might probably have like slightly different like methods, more than one. So, mm-hmm. do you want to go first, Ricky? Because like, I've been talking, so maybe let my my voice rest a bit. You, 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 can say, you can say your protocol, um, Ricky. I mean, my opinion is that, you know, like, everyone is different, and just like someone might be able to digest a certain piece of food within the course of 48 hours, uh, someone else might be able to do it in 24 hours, right? Yeah. Where someone might have a certain level of testosterone genetically, another person might have another level of t- uh, testosterone genetically. Um and that, to me, really uh, shows the difference in like the variability between person to person when it comes to uh, manipulating these factors and losing weight. Um, but generally, I feel like you know, if you obviously like your first go, you're not going to have the most optimal uh, weight cut. Like for myself, I've been doing this for two to three years, and I can absolutely say that I've had a few bad weight cuts where I didn't make weight, a few where I lost way too much weight. Um, you know, problems with the refueling, etc. But um, I mean, my my premise is as long as you follow like a few principles of um, uh, things backed by science, right? Like just the average uh, time that food goes from the mouth to the anus or something, and like the average digestion rate, right? For me personally, when it comes to um, fiber and just uh, food in the gut, I tend to um, give myself at least twenty four hours because. Uh, that that's borderline minimum for uh, the amount of time it would take to digest the food completely, especially uh, indigestible carbohydrates like fiber. Um, so yeah, I, I'm an average guy. I follow the average, and when I uh, offer my advice when it comes to loading and all these like manipulation factors, I, I try to follow the average, especially for someone who's only been doing it for the first time. Um, and that's also a big if because I almost never tell anyone because I think no one should want to it. I think like the only like the top one percent of lifters should water cut or if you have like a specific reason uh that like is very important to you like for example qualify qualifying for raw nationals it's incredibly important to you and you're achieving something whereas if you're just doing a local meet and you're like oh 
I want a 350 looks, right? Yeah. That could be <laughs> arguably less important. Um, like e even on an objective scale, right? I know it's subjective, but like, yeah. you know, so there's things of that nature. Let's, let's talk about a bit of norm then. Um, like not like in terms of statistically, but if we were to walk through, uh, you, like one of your water cuts, like do you mind actually going through this before I put you on the spot? I don't know if you're trying to hold your cards close to your chest no, or not. Uh, okay. Absolutely okay, not, good. yeah. Okay, so if we were doing, um, how far out do you start water loading? Like mm -hmm. everyone listening knows this is just for yourself. It's gonna change for everybody and you gotta figure it out yourself. But how far out do you start water loading and, um, and walk us through this many days out, this is how many gallons slash liters. Fuck, it just, I just rung a bell here. We do liters, you do gallons. There's going to be some translation oh, yeah. here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I'm going to be honest. I don't even know the conversion rate. I really should. Do, right? do, do, but, you guys, do, oh. do one of you guys have your phone in front of you where we can maybe oh, convert as we go? 3.78 liters, so. That's there you go, my man. man. <laughs> um, so we can maybe do, uh, if one of us has a phone, I don't got a phone in front of me. Or you know what? I can pull. I'm going to pull it up on the internet. We good. We good. Mm -hmm. um, so to do a little conversion for people listening, because we got a lot of people, uh, different parts of the world, that uh, they're going to go bonkers once we start going gallons and they're just going to tune out. Yeah, so, I, think, I think volume should be the only conversion uh, that we really need because I, you know, everyone uses grams, right? Well, power lifters. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to talk in like any other format outside of grams and kilos. Gallons to uh, liters. It should be like point, point 0.7. Okay, one gallon is 4.5 liters. Does that sound right? No, one gallon is 3.78 liters. It, yeah, I got the bottle right here. Hold up. Yeah. What do I <laughs> so it should be about point 0.7 of the value. Okay. Or uh, rather, oh, well, something, something like that. Let's see it. Let, hold on a second. Well, here, here's the thing though. When it like personally, I feel like when it comes to uh oh, Kendrick just logged out. I think we offended oh. him. We offended him with this conversion talk. Oh, sorry, buddy. Okay, <laughs> nah, so <I'm> back. <laughs> uh, I, I'll just go over a brief uh, uh briefing of what I do when it comes to water loading and manipulating everything else. Uh, it's very short and simple. Um, but I'm not sure if Kendrick agrees with this. I think when it comes to um refueling versus uh manipulating before the weigh-in, I think. You have a, a way larger, uh, way larger margin of error, or rather, you have more. Um, what's the, what's the word for it? Like you're able to mess up more before the weigh-in than you can after the weigh-in, especially based on the time constraints. That makes sense because right, yeah, that, yeah, for sure. There's a specific word, but I'm just not going to bother trying to think about it anyway. Yeah. So, so my my uh, my main point going into a water load is um, trying to adapt before I really get into something. So whether that's like going in the sauna and trying to get this, um, get like a sauna session in at least once per week, uh, a few weeks before that, that's what I love doing. And um, same thing with water on a daily basis. I drink at the very least one gallon. So uh, when it comes to specific numbers, I, I start tracking it seven days out. It's a little early, but um, you know, it's, it's nothing too, too big of an issue for me. Um, obviously, all the way up until the day before, I drank uh, upwards of two to four gallons. And this is. So let's see. Uh, Let me see. Yeah. Oh, so it should be That's two to four liters. gallons, like That's... seven liters to 14 liters. Yeah. Damn. Dude. So, my man. So you do that. Hold on. Is that the week of or is that leading up to that week? The week of. So the week, leading yeah, yeah, up okay. to the meet, um, yeah, yeah. I, I just on average drink one gallon minimum. Right. So I, I drink a lot of water nonetheless. I sweat a lot as well. Um, probably why I end up cramping and blacking out a lot because I lose a lot of electrolytes when I'm sweating. Yeah. But um, I count that, and that's very simple. I just build it up to three, and then uh, I just stop drinking water completely uh, 12 to 15 hours out, depending on how far I am in terms of um, uh, in terms of body weight, right? Compared to uh, competing body weight. The second thing that I focus on is sodium intake, and I also kind of eyeball this. I don't necessarily count the amount of sodium that I take on the entire day. Rather, I try to keep my nutrition uh, consistent, uh, and then I do sodium added on top of my daily intake of sodium. So I don't even count my daily intake. Rather, I just say, oh, uh, I'll add an additional four grams 
on this day. I also split it between morning and night because, you know, you might find out sooner or later if you take four to five grams of salt uh, at once, you, you end up shitting your pants. Right? <laughs> it, it, it's like a natural diuretic. Oh, really? Okay, um, I didn't know that. I'm not sure if that's the right term, but it definitely cleanses everything. It out there. cleanses. There's a nicer way of putting it. it right. <laughs> so I, I, I tend to uh, build that up to about uh, seven to eight grams, add it on top of my daily value of um, sodium. And I, I also don't really focus on uh, being too careful in terms of my upper limit because when you hit a certain point of uh, sodium intake, it's not like it's going to benefit uh, for you going above that limit, rather you just want to at least meet that limit. So I try to go slightly above it, um, just just as an insurance for me. Uh, and then about one day out, I um, I reduce my sodium intake to about 1.5 grams. So this is going from like 15 grams of sodium intake to one gram. Uh, obviously six or seven days of like high sodium to all of a sudden in one day I, I reduce my uh, sodium completely um, on top of uh, on top of the water right uh, no longer having a water 14 hours out this is terrible for you right uh, it's probably the worst feeling day when it comes to your water cutting protocol I have a quick question sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. but um, in terms of while you're walking up to that last day that you just said um, does mm -hmm. the water is the water slowly ramping up to the biggest climax and then cut or is it consistently across the board the water is 15 liters four gallons and so i usually so uh i usually hit my peak water intake at around um five or six days out but also in my opinion i don't think this is too important as well as long as you hit it at least at least four days out right and this is just a rough ballpark i I tend to like try to do a little bit of research, but you're not going to find anything except just like I said, like everything is very variable within person to person. Yeah. Um, so obviously I stop the water 14 hours out. I take one gram of sodium the entire day before weigh-ins about 24 hours out. Um, by that time I'm feeling like I have water intoxication, right? Your body starts heating up. You're very sluggish. You don't want to go out. You have a headache, right? Um, you know, you start losing a little bit of balance as well. Like, like, uh, for example, when I was at Worlds, uh, when I ran up the stairs after I did the sauna session, I could feel pockets of air in my ear, oh, wow. and I feel like it was messing with my vestib vestibular system. What is it called? Yes, yeah. uh, things dealing with balance. Okay. And I, I felt like I had to sit down until weigh-ins, and then I didn't recover from this uh, until you know well within the hour of uh, refueling. So those are the two most important things when it comes to uh, manipulating your body weight. But like Kendrick said, you can also incorporate um, the reduction of fiber. So two days out uh, of the weigh-ins, I go from any amount of fiber to less than 10 grams. And I like to do it between one to two days out because that's the average time for digestion. Um, again, very simple, but like I don't have anything uh, specific to back this up, rather just like just average digestion rates um let's see and then sometimes i incorporate a diuretic and i feel like i'm a little backed up you know it's just it's just like i sometimes i feel like that's the case what, what, what was it is it magnesium citrate uh yes <laughs> yeah right it is it is yeah i've only taken it once and it was before worlds and it worked uh it worked wonderfully yeah <laughs> my man I remember taking magnesium citrate once, and I was like, oh, this does nothing. This is garbage. And I had another, oh, okay. like, full bottle. I had yeah. another one. And mm -hmm. it was like, oh, hold the phone. I just didn't give it enough time. And li mm -hmm. listen to me. Don't be traveling. Don't be in a car. Don't be, like, get where you got to be and get that done and, like, in your hotel room and get ready. Because this thing, it, it does work. It will it will clean the pipes. It'll, it'll cleanse you. It'll cleanse you. Mm -hmm. You have to invest at least eight hours alone in a hotel room. You can't be doing anything else unless don't you want to be eating. Girl. And then all of a sudden, oop, Do I put not my have your girl with right, you. So. For God's sake, alone is key. Thank you, sir. Do not yeah. have your girl. Unless you, you will never have that relationship again. <laughs> um, and also, though, you want to be a decent amount. You don't want to be too far out. But you also don't want to have any kind of tummy rumbling come competition time when you got to wake up the next morning and, oh, I'm still feeling a little bit of effects here. I don't know if there's, I mean, again, that be, might be slightly different for everybody as well, how, how it affects you. But, um, I mean, I was all right, but I could, you could, when it's happening, you're like, oh my God, I 
better not feel like this tomorrow or there's no way in hell I'm throwing weight on my back and can mm -hmm. feel that compression. But um, so um, we'll, we'll get into the rehydration in a minute there. But is there, is that pretty much summed up there? Is there any extra tidbits in there that before the weigh in? Yeah, I mean, that, that's really it. When it comes to macronutrients, I don't really touch carbs, proteins, fats. I've done so before. Um, at the very least, I would maybe skew it 5% in terms of lowering carbohydrate intake and increasing fats, um, but nothing major. I've done it before, and uh, again, also anecdotal, I felt awful. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, that should be it, unless, um, you know, Kedrick might talk about something and might just resurface in my brain, so we'll see. Yeah, um, that's pretty much everything you said is what I've done as well, anecdotal, but um, myself, people I know, it, and it does vary a little bit, but in terms of just increasing water, sodium manipulation, cutting at the end, and this, I found the same thing in terms of macros. Um, cut the carbs a little bit, but it's when you really slash your overall calories that you're not going to bounce back the next day when you try to ram them all in. Uh, Cedric, my man, what do you think? What's, what's some of the protocols? I know we're talking generalization. Every, everything's going to change yep. for different lifters, different size of lifters, etc. But what's some of the yep. protocols you would say? Yeah. Look, I, I think this to quantify something, it's not a diuretic, it's a lexative, because technically diuretics are banned uh, yeah. in the water. So I don't I, I wanna I don't wanna be like, oh man, it's so <laughs> what diuretic is while I go back. Wait, are they really are they really banned? Uh like can... natural, natural stuff like dandelion root and stuff is not banned, but like chemically like those chemical diuretics, they are actually banned. So, so anything that has uh, to deal with like ADH is is off the Yeah. Like what about get coffee? Coffee? Uh, workout, or caffeine, just no, nah, no. I, I, I'm not exactly sure what are the compounds they test for. Like, there's probably a list of it. I, I'm not mm. sure, but those basically you can detect it in your pee, right? So, uh, okay. when yeah, yeah when okay. you do the pee test, to be able to detect it. And uh, is magnesium you, citrate? You, you get, is magnesium no. citrate banned? No, no, no. Okay, no. well, thank God because yeah. Yeah. thank God because yeah. I just admitted it. This is not going up, buddy. This is not. Going up, okay? I, I'm like, let me just timestamp this so I yeah. don't edit, edit that the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, I only take creatine. Okay? That's yeah. right. My, yeah, that, basically, I'm just a spy trying to like. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah, you're using yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, there's a lot of behind it. Like, yeah. <laughs> take, take away Taylor Edwards' like potential competition, they never compete. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I mean, I, I, I think a good question that Ryan asked was uh, whether you gradually ramp up or you just use a fixed like water intake, right? Because I, I think um, the, the reason why I, I'm still sort of, like doing my PhD in rapid weight cutting because there, there, there are really different methods out there. So uh, I, I'm, I'm in New Zealand, so I train at this gym called North Shore Model, a uh, great gym. And one of the owners, is, his name is Joel, I think competed at Worlds in 2018, right? So um, prior to like coming here, like he usually does like all of the water loading, water cutting protocol for like the New Zealand team, right? So, and we, ha we have a lot of conversations regarding the water loading protocol. And I know he gradually ramps the water up, right? Whereas I do it differently, I have a fixed like intake. So, mm. and the reason why I do this is because like, it's based on like empirical data, like there is research, like most, as far as my knowledge, there's only one paper looking at water loading. So I, I use very similar protocol. So what they do is uh, three days out, they have 100 ml of water, so kilo body weight. So uh, one liter per 10 kilo. So if you have seven, if you're 70 kilos, you lose 70 liters of water, right? Okay. So, yeah, right? So it's one, one, one liter per 10 kilos body weight, and they do it for three days in a row. But what, what I usually like to do just from more of a, like, practice point of view uh, is that I do it four days out, and the first day I give, it, I give 80% of what they're supposed to consume just as, like, an introduction. Because mm. for some people, I know people that literally don't drink water at all. Like, they drink one liter of water a day. Right. Yeah, if that like maybe like, glass. It's terrible, yeah. man. I used to be terrible. That, I got It's kind of gross. It's kind of gross. I'm like a child. I have yeah. to sweeten my water to make myself drink it. I, yeah, I am yeah. terrible. I, I can't drink water, yeah. man. It's too boring. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. So when, when we say water, I mean fluid, right? So anything that has fluids in it. So whether your tea, your coffee, that counts as well. So use it interchangeably. It's not, uh, so I use the first day, four days out, 80% of what it's supposed to cost you. Uh, and that amount is based on how heavy you are. So if you, if, 
10, one meter per 10 kilo body weight. So 80% on day one, and then for day two, three, and four, we keep it fixed, right? So it's a fixed, fixed amount. And at, on the last day, which is uh, 24 hours post, uh, sorry, 24 hours pre-weigh-in, uh, you cut them, cut it down to 15 ml per kilo body weight, which is really, really low. Uh, that's like a reduction of like almost, like it's like 85% reduction of water, right? So that, that, that's a really low amount uh, that, that is 24 hours out. So now that we've got like the water loading out of the way, we, I kind of like can touch about, touch upon other stuff. So in terms of gut manipulation, it's very similar to what Ricky does as well. Uh, usually one to two days, sometimes depending on people, some like to do it three days prior as like an insurance policy. Uh, and and that, that's completely fine as well. Uh, like they change the composition of food, mainly to fiber, uh, just because fiber sits in the gut a little bit longer, vary from individual to individual. Uh, and then uh, usually like the composition of food from like they, the calories are keep the same, right? You keep the calories the same just to be at maintenance level because you don't want to be too deep into energy deficit. In a way, I still like to have uh, carbohydrates in the diet. Some people use carbohydrate depletion protocol, but to be honest, I, I think that uh, the risk reward might not be there just because one, the first thing is that unless you're doing some form of activity, most of the carbohydrates is stored as glycogen in your muscle, right? That's like four to 500 grams of carbohydrate in your muscle. And if you, you're not contracting, you're not depleting that. What you're actually depleting is your liver glycogen, which is, uh, you deplete it through fasting. Because when you're fasting, you're not eating, your body has to supply blood sugar, right? So uh, that is only like maybe 100 grams, so 120 grams, which is very, very small amount. So if you're not eating carbohydrates, you're actually depleting liver glycogen instead of muscle glycogen. Mm. Uh, and if you want to deplete muscle glycogen, you need to like do like vigorous exercise, which is counterintuitive during a taper or when you're supposed to be resting. So I'm not a big like carbohydrate We still, I still see you. Did we, did you, did we, I think we dropped on his end. Right. Am I back? Yeah, yeah. you then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're saying well, you well, don't, you don't believe in cutting carbohydrates? Yeah. So I'm not a big fan of like cutting carbohydrates or depleting carbohydrates, meaning like shifting everything from like having really low carbs to like everything's like fat, you know? I'm not a big uh, fan of that because I find that sometimes when you do it, you can, it's too much of perturbation from the regular diet and I know people that some people can't just they just can't take high fat foods like myself, you know. Like the I minute mean, I take like a lot of fat and like eat a greasy pizza, I'm running to the toilet straight away, you know, things like that. So I do have a slight shift, maybe have more energy like than to like maybe increase like fat intake to an extent, but not completely shifting carbohydrate to fat. So that that is uh, how I look at gut manipulation. What and what do you think about um what do you think about, like, in the circumstance of 24-hour weigh-ins? Would your opinion change on that if you have uh, a larger period of time to kind of rejuvenate, uh, you know, any lost glycogen? Uh, and, and in that scenario, like, the risk-reward of losing extra water and extra mass and having extra time to kind of come back from it, and you could potentially use IVs when it comes to 24-hour weigh-ins, right? What do you think about that? Yeah, so when it comes to 24-hour weigh-ins, you can lose a lot of weight, right? You can lose a lot. Like yeah. what, whatever, I think whatever you and I are recommending with you is based on a 12 way in, mm -hmm. what the IPF uh, sort of like imposes the 12 way in period. But when it's 24 hour way in, things get a little bit like more extreme because if you look at the combat support literature, people can lose up to 15 to 18, uh, like 15 to 18 percent of body weight, right? Oof. In 24 hours. Yeah. yeah. Like so that, I, that, that so is a combat sport. So I can't be 74 right? kilo. And, <laughs> so I can't be 74 kilo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see if you so, qualify for world that. Yeah, I would be on death's door. <laughs> so the 24 hour way in is uh, waters get a little bit more muddy, but I would say you could potentially like look at depleting glycogen. But when you look at combat sport, like combat athletes, like the first thing they do is actually in, like they exercise and sweat, right? So they use uh, active dehydration. Right, sauna is a passive dehydration, basically you just sit and then dehydrate yourself. But active is like you dehydrate yourself through activity, so they exercise while wearing like sweatsuits and stuff, yeah, yeah, uh, and like garbage, garbage bags, right? So the, the exercise would deplete the glycogen, uh, and then the sweatsuit removes water. But the thing is that when if you want to like deplete carbohydrates in your muscle, you have 
it's not that easy because when you cycle, like cycling, I think like 70% of like your VO2 max, uh, most people might not know what it is, but it's just who cares about VO2 max. Uh, you cycle like 70% of it for 90 minutes, you need to sleep your bicycle like 50%. And you put a power lift on a bike for 90 minutes, cycle, they, they, I would guarantee that they would store the next day for cycling instead of anything else, just because their body's not conditioned to that. Mm. So I think a 24 hour weigh in, uh, I, I, I still don't feel like depleting glycogen because, I mean, if you think about it, 400 grams of glycogen uh, carries like 3 grams of water, so you probably lose up to maybe 1 kilo from depleting glycogen. Mm. And I think that the risk reward ratio isn't that. So I would say that you can potentially push more extreme methods like passive dehydration, right, through a sauna and lose mm. more weight and then re recover from that. So but I, I'm not a, just a quick follow-up question there before you move on. So basically, um, the only reason why you do active cutting in terms of sweating be on a bike inside the sauna, when you see some of those UFC guys doing it, they have 24-hour weigh-in so they, can, they think they can do it, is to also decrease glycogen levels, but you, you wouldn't necessarily sweat more because you have that time. So they think they could decrease a little more by doing that, but you don't think the juice is worth the squeeze, the risk reward ratio, because you won't lose that much more by being active. And on top of that though, even using that much activity when the next day you're gonna have to fight, and you're just, you know, you're, it would it not impact you as well just for performance wise. If you, it, I mean, let's, let's apply it to powerlifting. If you're powerlifting too, doing that much rigorous activity the day before probably isn't what they would normally do. And if you do it and it's not something yeah. you would normally do, it's going to impact your nervous system and impact your performance because you're not on a bike regularly One, doing 45 yeah, minutes. 100%, 100%. I think the combat athletes do it because, like, what, I mean, MMA fighters, combat athletes, they're probably, like, the most, like, one of the hardest working athletes you yeah. find. So whatever they're doing now is literally a reduction in training for them, you know? Yeah. Like, but for how this stuff, who has never done this before, this is, like, an increase of training, right? So... Where you should be recovering instead of like increasing your training. But for the combat athletes, they've been doing it so so frequently that this mm -hmm. is like second nature to them, which is why it works for them, right? Uh, whereas for powerlifter, it's going to be uh, much much more difficult to, to recover from. From uh, so yeah, I think I think you you hit the uh, you hit the head of the nail there, Ryan, with, with with saying that yeah, you know, they're just not used to it. Whereas the combat athletes, they are used to it, so that's why they can do it. Uh, but actually, I'm not, I'm no, I'm no expert in 24 hour weigh in. Uh, but I think the last part to touch upon would be, we can mention sauna, right? I mean, I mentioned a little bit of like passive dehydration. I would, mm -hmm. for a two hour weigh in protocol, I would look, I would say that, uh, I would not recommend heat stress just because it's very close to, to, uh, the weigh in, right? Two hours later, you're competing and then the heat stress is still, uh, on. I mean, not on you, but you, you're still experiencing some of acute heat stress uh, from the sauna. I would say uh, for people that try that, only use it as a last resort. So I would I would exploit every single layer, every single method, then go into heat stress. But what I think what Ricky does, so, I mean, a question before I go into this is like, I mean, you go to Korea a lot. Where were you born actually? Were you born in America? No, I was born here. I um, I did. I have been recently going to Korea a lot. Hold on a second. That's oh, racist. Okay. Hold on. Whoa, whoa. That was racist. You can't ask that. <laughs> in the world. <laughs> or, oh, or you can ask that. I can't ask that. Actually, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so it, it, the, the, the reason why I asked is because, like, uh, there, there is some data out there looking at heat, uh, heat acclimation and mm. using that for uh, using that as a method to reduce the impact of heat stress mm. when you actually use some form of sauna. So it's based on like environmental one, temperatures there, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. So one, one thing that's really interesting is that they, they look at, I think one of my uh, colleagues, like uh, he also looks into like weight cutting and stuff. Uh, he's from like, his name is Dave Nolan, he's from uh, Dublin. So what he, he, he brought this to light to me is that uh, I think people that are born in like tropical countries, at least and stay there for the first three years of uh, when they were born, we have like more flat glands, right? Our flat glands, we sweat more because mm -hmm. that is an adaptation to the environment. So potentially in the sauna, I could lose water weight quicker than someone who was born in like a cold country, you know? Mm -hmm. ah, so, so like our Russian friends and, and people from Sweden, 
would have a harder time cutting um, just with the DNA factors, whereas somebody from like the Bahamas who's used to su sweating and it's it's in there like it's part of uh, the evolution of them living there, so they have to be sweating. Um, yeah. It's going to be easier for them to cut weight. Yeah, I, I would say that given the same time, right, this is all, uh, I mean, this is all like, I mean, I don't think like any six research has been done on this, but based on what we have right now, I think given the same time, we put like two people from like myself, I'm from Malaysia, so it's like 30 to 33 degrees year round, we, we don't have, uh, we don't have seasons there, so you put myself versus uh, someone uh, from like, maybe like Russia, who's like always cold uh, in the sauna with the same temperature, the same time, I could potentially lose more weight from sweat compared to the other person just because my I would say like sweat just I'm more porous, you know, like my sweat just, just expels more sweat. You know as, what and this, adaptation to the environment. This this is actually leads me to a question then. Because I had seen this online and I don't know if you guys seen it as well. Some people leading into a water cut will actually try to train them they start um, going in the sauna regularly leading into, I mean, well in advance, weeks in advance, to get their body sweating more often and being used to releasing water through sweat, etc. And then, so when they get into that final week, now, is that, does that actually work? Is there any science behind that? Is that all anecdotal or what are we looking at? Right, right. Uh, I mean, that's the reason why I asked the question. We've got a, a, a tangent, right? A side tangent to that would be there, there is research done, I think, out from uh, Oliver Bali's lab in Australia, and they look at acclimation uh, to heat, and then followed by using heat as a way to lose weight. And it's very interesting what they used was they used, uh, they basically did 12, 12 one hour sauna, right? Obviously, they spread it out, and the minimum you, you need is to do it like, uh, like three times, like three times a week. So you, you do it three times a week to uh, acclimatize yourself towards that heat. And what they actually found was that uh, people that, they, when they use uh, that heat uh, acclimation technique, at the end of it, they actually sweat more, right? And the RPE, or like the, how stressful it is in the sauna, is lower. And th that could also be uh, like an adaptation to like the proteins in the body because uh, we, we have stuff in our body called heat shock pro protein and our body like we like to be at 37 degrees right our core, core temperature and you impose like a sauna really really uh really close right your core temperature will go up it's like having a fever fever and certain enzymes in the body might not work that could potentially impact uh the, the way the body functions uh, i'm not so sure how much that plays in the power thing but what they show was that when you uh acclimate the heat after like 12 hours uh 12 one hour session, you actually mm -hmm. sweat more, uh, and the negative effect is actually lower. So, oh damn, so it does work. Yeah. And Ricky, so you know, are you saying you do this? It works, but I don't, I don't think powerlifters should do it because, like, I mean, twelve hours of. I, I disagree on that point. Um, so you know what's funny is I actually heard about that study. Uh, funny enough, is on another podcast, right? And that's partly the reason why I started doing it going into worlds. Right, uh, all about acc acclimating, um, just so that you don't get uh, like a huge response to the stress. Right, all of a sudden, right before midday, as well as a adapting to uh, the things that you were talking about. Um, I think it's very important for um, for someone that decides to use um, heat in terms of dehydration. Right, um, obviously, I'm also on board with you too. That like almost no one should should do that unless they're you know closing on six to seven percent body weight in terms of um what they need to lose right but when it comes to um if they've exhausted every other facet of what we've talked about before this then and, and they're expecting that uh such as me when i was going into worlds and they should definitely try um incorporating this into their training regimen maybe um doing like one to two times a week for one hour sessions um after after their workouts for you know six to seven weeks right so it's like basically yeah. it's advanced if you've, if you've been doing this, you know what you're doing. Uh, this would be the next level stuff to take it up. When you when you anticipate, hey, this is, I'm going to have to sweat. You already know you're going to have to sweat. Based off previous history, you're getting bigger and bigger. And the percentages that you're going to have to cut, you're already doing the math. Well, this is going to mm. be a 6 or 7% cut. This is, a, this is a tool you can use. I feel like in powerlifting, though, like like what Kedrick was saying, um, you know, almost no one is doing that. I, I I really do think I'm probably the only guy that's done anything like remotely close. So like, I, you know, what's funny is I remember talking to you about this, and this is why I was so interested in your work. Um, me and Kedrick, we we talked uh, 
partly after uh, I finished competing for like an hour or two about this subject. And um, no, really, like no, no one does this. Like no one really delves into, uh, you know, manipulating four to six percent of their body weight, especially at the elite level. You almost see um, like zero IPF lifters doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's it's unexplored territory. Yeah, it's, it's yep. it really is. Sorry, Kendrick, you could go ahead. But it is. That's why this this episode, if you have this tool, it's such an advantage. Like if you could just base if you could be bigger than everybody you go against. That's a that's a mm-hmm. mass, that's a big equalizer. I mean, um, and and if you know how to do it properly, and so many people are going to tinker with this, do it improperly, and it's going to. This is one thing that three months of work out the fucking window if you cut wrong. I mean, you could yeah. peak, hit all these PRs, and be like, I'm about to smash. People are going to know me come tomorrow, and then literally you fumble the ball, and the whole thing's out the window. Yeah, I mean, like, if you're going to do something this sophisticated and nuanced, right, you should absolutely hire a coach, right, uh, a nutrition coach, some, someone that has knowledge to kind of, like, back you up on this because, you know, um, you know, I feel like Kedrick and I have been talking about, like, very small nuances of this, like, for example, the sauna thing, uh, separating the sodium intakes two times a day instead of taking it all at once, right? These small things can absolutely ruin your experience when it comes to water cutting, um, and, you know, he could save you the trouble of doing so. Right, just yeah. by telling you. And experience, yeah. like, don't like I I want to cut in practice procedures so many times before the actual competition, because if you just like you had said, everybody's different. And Kendrick, you had said as well, the variation from athlete to athlete, even for yourself, the target keeps moving. So you every now and then, uh, like whenever someone's going to do a cut before a competition, they've been keep eating a few years. Or like think about doing a cut. I'm like my friend, do a cut. In between, not at the competition, do the rehydrating, which we'll get into in a second, do the whole procedure, and then go to the gym and see how it feels. A, the more you do something, the less scary it is, the less the cortisol levels are going to rise, the whole procedure is going to be a lot easier the more you do it. B, you start getting some data on yourself. How much? Mm-hmm. How much? How many liters or gallons do you need? What sodium do you need? Um, do you need to sweat? Do you need to decrease your body weight because you're a little too far out? Or do you have extra room and you can actually increase your body weight because, man, that cut went so good. It's amazing. And you can work those things out. People, I think people actually don't give it the respect it needs. And they think that's what you're going to do last minute and do it right before the competition and think, well, let's just, let's just shoot our shot and hope everything works well. Just like programming with weights. You gotta collect data and adapt and take things in, take things out and adapt to each individual person. And after like a year and a half, two years, you're like, I think I got it. Whereas some mm-hmm. people actually think like, yeah, I took a protocol and I did the protocol and it didn't work. It's like, well, it doesn't mean the protocol didn't work, my man. It means you did it once before a competition, <laughs> didn't know yeah. how to practice and expect it just to click it into place. And if it doesn't work, then fucking water cutting doesn't work. It's, or it's not for me. You didn't give it a chance, man. That's not the way. Like almost nothing in life works like that, mm-hmm. or it just has yeah. to work on the fly. Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, at the end of the day, I, I don't think we see and I disagree on that. But it's like it's more like a nuance, right? Like if mm-hmm. like we both agree that most people shouldn't be using sauna unless it's the absolute last resort. But I, I agree with you on the point that yeah, you know, if you do decide to use some form of like passive dehydration through like sauna, there are ways to mitigate the decorative performance, you know, and that like uh explanation of heat is one of them. But like that is your absolute last resort because for most most part, you know, like if the power system you're gonna get like three hundred wheels, I mean dude, you're not you don't have to spend freaking twelve hours on the corner to get a three hundred wheels, you know. Yeah. You, 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 you should really where you are right now. Right? That's too savage, bro. Well, all, 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 twelve weeks all summer he's visiting saunas and like like my brother, yeah. my brother, what are we doing here? What are we talking about? I'm yeah. not no, t- yeah. keep your money. I'm not even walking you through this. Um, I, one I, one question I do have. Um, we're talking about using heat, and oh. is there a difference between sauna and using a hot bath in terms of um, how it impacts you, how it might impact <clears throat> your performance? How I've read articles. Again, these are just articles. Where it pulls water from changes if it's a sauna, a bath, if you use Epsom salts. Um, is there any validity to those, or, or what have you found with the research you've done there, Kendrick? Most people, at least the research, everything, <coughs> sorry, uh, everything is done in the sauna. I mean, the, the, the thing is because when it comes to research, 
we have we need a tightly controlled environment mm -hmm. and it's easier to control the temperature of a sauna compared to putting a thermometer in the hot bath and then mm -hmm. like oh you know when temperature goes up i put hot water and temperature goes down so yeah. i put cold water so the, the sauna is it's a thick environment you can just control it from the outside and some people do say that yeah you know like because of like it, it might be like completely like bollocks but because like you know some people say oh sweat the sweat so like the sweat reduces my core temperature and stuff it could be the same for water but i don't think it's actually true uh, because i think that research that actually shown that whether you wipe off the sweat or not when you sauna doesn't really matter uh, so but i would say with the sauna we can get it right better just because the temperature is much more controlled right mm. and it, it's more like yeah, it's more like tight, right? Like if you're in a 60 degree sauna, you know that's a 60 degree sauna. How many people are going to put like a, a thermometer in the water and stuff and just measure, you know, and like hope for the best. And the thing is that, the thing is if you do this, in fact, you use some form of heat acclimation is that you acclimate to a certain level of heat, right? So if you've been using like a 45 degree sauna, you uh, acclimate that and you go in a freaking 7 degree sauna, that's still going to wreck you because 20 degrees, I mean, that's really hot, you probably die, are, but... Are we uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit? We gotta start converting that to... Sorry, Celsius, right? I mean, 70, 70, 70. <laughs> yeah, 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 because, yeah, I just because, thought it was because, funny the way you said that. <laughs> we, <Yeah. laughs> we, am I gonna have to convert this to... This turns into a disaster for our international lifters. <laughs> but, mm, right. uh, but I got yeah. you. Yeah, so it's just that I feel like the sauna is a little bit more uh, in control, and when it comes... I think when you are pushing that kind of level, the more tightly controlled you can make the situation, the better it is for you. Yeah. Anyway. So because yeah, that, because it is yeah. um, you're one hundred percent. You can end up spending all flipping night in the sun if you don't get the heat right, or if you actually get a little more precise and you know, look, give me at the specific temperature, and I'm gonna pull. Relatively speaking, because it's always a moving target, that one thing I've taken away from this discussion, but you'll know, at least be able to anticipate an hour in should equal this much body weight and um, exactly. it's more efficient as opposed to staying in that sauna all day and night, stressing on the body, and then um, and then again, man, cortisol levels can go up because you're stressing, you're like, oh my God, the, weight, the weight's not coming off properly. Um, in terms of that, how long, uh, and Ricky Slater touched up on it, he said for himself, he has an idea of, how far out he likes to kind of go through the dehydration phase um and mm -hmm. he's got his, his his comfort zone for his body and, it's, and i realize it's going to change for everybody but is there a barometer roughly on how long you'd like to see an athlete stay dehydrated for this might change for each individual lifter but what would you say in terms of a guiding stick a measuring stick is probably appropriate to stay stay dry okay I, i'm either guy Ooh. So I'm I'm ex I'm extremely curious to see what Kedrick says because I have incredibly strong opinions on on oh. the topic they just brought up. Right? Oh, right. Wow, so um, follow like, that like, coming because I like this is like one of the things that I criticize about many top coaches, um, and, and like I genuinely like wonder what their reasonings are. But I kind of want to see what Kedrick says first. So I don't like influence anything. Okay. Is that sounds yeah? Sounds we we all, we all want to be friends after this though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, <laughs> <laughs> if Kendrick says something you don't like, your strong uh, feelings, you just dip. You're like, well, that's that. That's it. We're not friends no more. I, <laughs> I, I, I would say, like, I think if I interpret the question correctly, uh, how long should an athlete be dehydrated for, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. roughly. If you're trying to time yeah. this, uh, because here's here's the the ultimate flip side is the in reality, there's also sleep, and it becomes. Do I wake up super early? And if you got a lifter who's like, look, if you wake me, I ain't going back to sleep. And if I don't get to sleep by a certain point, like it, it becomes one of those, do I stay dehydrated longer and actually get some sleep in? Or, I mean, I, mean, I guess I'm, I'm really throwing curveballs at both you guys by complexing it, but this is the reality of it, right? And then there's, well, you know, if you're trying to balance out sleep and dehydration, et cetera. Yeah, it, 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 it's a great question that you asked because that is actually uh, the third study that I'm going to do for my PhD because there's no data out there. So mm -hmm. uh, that, is, that, that is literally the question people ask all the time because uh, the first is that, I mean, if we look at advantages, right? So let, let, let's put it from this point of view. We look at the pros and cons from each situation. Situation one is that you sauna before you sleep, right? You sleep to an extended period of dehydration. 
Uh, the second situation is that you sauna closer to the mean, right? So if you look at situation one, the pros is that you, you will sleep knowing that you've made weight, right? So you sleep knowing that you've made weight. So that could potentially help you sleep better. But on the flip side, because you're so dehydrated, that could disrupt your sleep, right? So that's uh, two, uh, two points of view. But you don't have acute heat stress because after the sauna, you probably take a cold shower and then after you sleep, the acute heat, heat stress would dissipate. So that, if you do all this price bit, these are the, the three things that you would potentially encounter. So upside is that no acute heat, no acute heat stress, uh, and you sleep knowing that you made weight. Downside would be you sleep to an extended period of dehydration, right? Or so that is for situation one. Situation two, uh, you wake up early. First, you go to bed knowing that you've not made weight, so you're not even sure whether you've made weight yet. So that that feeling of uncertainty is there. Yeah. That might affect your affect your sleep. Second, you wake up earlier, and that reduces the amount of times you are able to sleep. And third is that you have like acute heat stress uh, going into the meat because of a two-hour weigh-in. So right now, I I honestly do not know. Right? And like the answer is I don't know. Uh, and I'll say that for a fact, and that's why I'm trying to answer that question because I would, I think my PhD is very practical. I want to give like listeners practical tools that they can use. Yeah. If you were to sauna, which is a better situation to be in? Uh, but I would say if you, people are used to sleeping like dehydrated, I would. Yeah. Okay, I, it, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to to to, to give my opinion here. But I would say it's very individual. Could you also, and I've, I've done both, messing around with both, and I've also done halfway. So I'll get dehydrated to an extent, um, and then if I wake up in the morning and I got time, I'm like, let me see where I'm at. I should be close or whatever. And it is, it, it, it really depends on the person. Because if you think, like if you're not a great sleeper, and um, if you think knowing you have to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning means you're just not going to sleep that night, like I've done that being like, I'm going to set my alarm for four in the morning, cut everything in the morning and then, and then show up for the weigh-ins. And then I'm like, fuck, I, I could not fall asleep. Knowing I got to wake up at four, I'm like, I was all types of upset and grumpy. And then I got to cut weight. And then I walked in there. So I feel dehydrated and I haven't slept. And then, uh, but on the flip side, if you're dehydrated for, you know, long periods of time, you're not going to feel great either. It, uh, this is when rehydration protocols, etc. And it could come down to individual. So mm -hmm. how do you feel, Ricky? What have you felt yourself? Okay, just um, before I get into this, I do have to leave relatively soon. So if you guys are interested in like talking about rehydration after, I feel like, and if people want it, I feel like that might be, like we could, I mean, me and Kedrick DM each other. I sent him like a study on like protein intake and like water retention. Yeah. So it's a subject that we've talked about and we're very familiar with. But um, so to begin with, like, I, I remember we talked about bath versus sauna. Just to simplify, I think baths are way more efficient, but like you said, incredibly difficult to maintain temperatures. So when it comes to, uh, you know, keeping a relatively steady heart rate, um, I think it's not worth it. And it's just in your best interest to go to the sauna where you know the absolute temperature uh, and you know that's, that's going to be relatively constant. So you can kind of time in your breaks and how long you're going to be in the sauna. So you can kind of measure um, how much you sweat out and how, how fast your heart rate goes. Now, when it comes to um, what we were talking about. Oh, yeah. So hitting the sauna before or after you sleep. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you did uh, – you did half of it before you sleep and half of it after. That, that's something that completely like skipped my mind. I feel like that would be an excellent independent variable for your study, right? That is, I didn't even think of that. But my opinion is that um, when you go to the level of uh, like trying to dehydrate uh, or try to manipulate uh, five or six percent of your body weight, I think it's um, absolutely necessary for you to do it right before you meet. Whereas if you're cutting, you know, maybe like two to four percent, you have the luxury of doing it before you um, before you sleep. And when it comes to mentality going into um, whether or not you're going to make it, uh, you mentioned that, you know, doing this is kind of like a moving target. And I think the way I think about it is the same way, right? Uh, whether I'm going to make weight or not, I'm not entirely sure. And it's not something that's going to stress me. Rather, um, to be like 100% efficient, you're never going to know exactly, right? You kind of have to like throw the dart and see if it's going to get close, if it's a little over. 
right? Because you don't want to overdo it, right? You're, let's say you're in the sauna and you just do it a little bit too much and you're half a kilo under, you're, you're a little less efficient than if you're, um, or a little less optimal than if you're right on the dot, right? Um, so same thing applies here. I think that um, sleeping dehydrated uh, to the level that we have to, or I have to dehydrate is the worst thing, right? Um, again, all anecdotal, I would love to see that study. I think that's a great idea. But um, I've had so much more success uh, doing this dozens of times, uh, doing it right before, especially after I adapt and acclimate to the sauna sessions uh, several weeks into training, mm. right? Um, it, it's almost like like having 12 hours of dehydration, fully dehydrated, I, I dehydrated, I might feel amazing that like, I know that I'm going to make weight, but I can barely sleep. I feel like my stress levels are through the roof, whereas I do it right before. Yeah, my stress levels are through the roof for that time being. Um, I'm obviously cutting it close, but I think the time of dehydration matters in terms of like how well you can refuel um, and the position of your body in terms of like strength and uh, like how you will perform in the meet. Right, and I'm, I'm pulling this all on my ass. It's all like just what I've experienced personally, but I, I feel so strongly about it that I'm almost like, and I know this sounds like the furthest thing away from scientific, but <laughs> but I've done this so much that I feel like it it really does mean something. I, you know, I, like, I agree too. Here, here's the thing. So I've done, um, and this is anecdotal as well, but I've dehydrated enough the night before where I, let's say I gotta wake up really early. It's, uh, mm -hmm. especially if you gotta travel the whole night. And I do not, I, sleeping's an issue for me, like my whole life. So I do, I'm not going to sleep early. It just is what it is. So if I got to wake up really early to cut, and it's an early morning weigh-in, um, if I got to wake up too early, like I'm straight up not, like I'm not going to sleep. So mm -hmm. you look at studies where um, just not even just cognitive abilities and decision making and how you handle stress when you haven't slept, but even like your baseline strength levels, performance output, what happens with no sleep, Rogan had a guy on three hours. This is a whole other podcast. I realized when we get it to sleep, the deprivation. But it can also, <laughs> yeah. it, it can, it can also, it depends on the individual. It can also impact you. So then, what I've done to not also be too dehydrated for too long would be get close enough that I know. All right, I don't. If I wake up any more than two hours before. Um, man, I'm just gonna be straight up sleeping like two hours and I'm gonna have like a terrible, you feel sketchy, you know when you haven't slept, you feel sketchy, like, especially if you mm -hmm. travel, if you travel internationally to the other side of the world, you got problems. So you might get close enough to this target, go to sleep, you're not crazy dehydrated, you're like, I'm all right, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's all right. Wake up with that time framing in mind because you've done it a bunch of times, be like, so you know how much sleep you, you, you're gonna get and it's at least, let's say you're like, I want at least six hours, any less than that, then I'm going to be sketchy the next day. Again, some people might be like, man, I never sleep that night anyways. Or some people are like, if I don't get sick, I'm in trouble. So it's, it kind of comes down to individual people. Yeah, and then like obviously there's other factors that might influence that too. For example, let's say that you do a little bit of dehydration, you go to sleep, right? Uh, that could signal to your body that you're severely dehydrated and uh, promote uh, hormones that uh, aid in water retention or something along those lines. So then when you wake up, you won't be able to lose all that water. Yeah. And it's all these small things that are super annoying and That's you can never point. get a grasp of it. I'm but I really hope that. that you do it, Kendrick. Like, I feel like you're the man to do that kind of stuff. Dude, that's so. a really good point. If, um, I don't know, Kendrick, if you hit on that, when, when is your heart at, Ricky? When My is your, heart? You, you, when is your heart out for leaving this podcast? Because you got something to do. Oh, um, I mean like 8.25, but okay. yeah, I can probably push to like 30. Let me ask you uh, before you leave, because if you're leaving first, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll hop over to Kendrick. Some mm -hmm. of your rehydrating and um, food protocols after, let's say, you made weight. Mm -hmm. well, well, what are some of the protocols you use? Let's say the weights, you made weight, you're good. Because if we uh -huh. got you for 15 minutes, let, let me milk you for the next 15 minutes. I'll let you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, oh, man. This is like, this is such a loaded question. I feel like there, I, I could make like a 10 page paper just based on like what you can refill with. And I'm sure Kedrick knows just as much, or if not more, he definitely knows more than me. Um, so I guess like, I'll just tell you the baseline of what I do, yeah. right? Uh, liquid with electrolytes, right? liquid sources for the first 20 minutes where I try to down myself, whether it's, um, yeah, I, obviously they have to be very easily digestible and like very readily bioavailable carbohydrates, um, simple carbs. 
I haven't tested anything with like glycerol or things along those lines, but uh, sometimes I bring in naked juice, right? Uh, fructose. Um, and then after that portion, I like to take a scoop of whey protein because I read a single study that says that water retention is promoted when you take a single scoop of protein. Okay. Very counterintuitive because it's a protein, right? Yeah. Like, uh, why would you want to spend your time digesting a protein when you could do other meaningful things with your time? I don't know, right? So I like the, the way my guidelines work is I try to find the new trends, things that work, and I try to implement it and see if it works because you're not going to know absolutely or even remotely close to if it's correct or not until like you know there have been several repeated studies and that most likely won't happen because this isn't a topic that's incredibly popular yeah. with the general public yeah. right oh for sure general, so, public, uh, general public should never have to do this in their day-to-day -day life oh Mary no, sir, yeah please 55 year old housewife <laughs> is not worried about this kind of procedure this is like yeah. the population in a in a body weight sport Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So pretty much liquids first, uh, electrolytes are incredibly important. Um, the ratio of sodium to potassium, uh, you know, I don't think it's too important. I, I would definitely like you to ask, I'll listen to this after, but ask Kedrick what he thinks happened to Michael C. Yeah. Because okay. um, like from what I've heard, they told me that it was a ratio of potassium to sodium, which I think is complete bull honky, right? But again, I don't really know much about this. Like this is just based on my very like general service knowledge of like the topic have you heard my water bottle theory what's your that, that sounds <laughs> kind of gross but i'd rather not <laughs> you got to his water bottle remember oh <laughs> the villain strikes again yeah, watch your water bottle like something else yeah. watch your water bottles ladies and gentlemen that's where that magnesium citrate pops in uh -oh. oh shit yeah that guy's hella dehydrated it's not tri roll <laughs> man it's it's laxative <laughs> but um what about is there is there um, have you ever experienced, and I don't know if you have or, or not, but too much sodium? I think Sean Noriega at one point was saying he, he had too much sodium and he felt cramping because of that. He felt uh, tons of water retention. And, you know, have you ever experienced that? Have you ever read anything yourself, Ricky, in terms of that? I, I don't necessarily, necessarily know if it causes cramping, but um, in terms of well being, it definitely makes you feel worse, uh, especially. Like, you know, at a certain point, you're going to reach a top and then the uh, benefits end up turning into negatives, right? Yeah. Um, I I've had experiences where I've become so bloated that I wasn't able to really generate enough force. Um, and, you know, at certain times, like, you might have as much sodium and potassium and other electrolytes, like chlorine or something along those lines, right? Um, that, okay, sorry, calcium, I don't know what's chlorine. Um, but you, you might still cramp up, right? Like going into worlds, uh, whenever I tried hooker it, my finger would get stuck. Scariest thing of my life, right? Like I was like, oh shit, it's permanent, right? But then I'll just pull <laughs> back and it's good. Yeah. Um, so it, like I said, like it's a dangerous thing because you don't know if it's going to go well because it might go shit even if you do everything perfectly, but, um, you're doing it because you might have the opportunity for it to go perfectly and the effects are perfect as well. Right. So and, and for like me, I feel like that's what happened at Raw Nationals this year mm. um, outside of hip injury. So, um, I mean, that's really it. it's, it's a simple process. And uh, I think Kedrick should definitely expand on these ideas. But that, that's the one thing I would definitely like him to talk about is what he thinks happened to Michael C. It, it, going into deadlifts. One thing for you, Bounce. What about food, uh, your food intake? Because sometimes I see people eating things like meat which I don't know if they're going to digest in time to actually uh, get the system for any kind of lifting that day. Is there mm -hmm. actual foods and consumptions that you do uh, throughout the day, like foods that you know you're going to digest and you're going to use that energy on the day of the lift? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I put uh, meats into my, uh, into my refueling tactics as well because there have been studies that show that if you have a certain amount of um, – you know like how people say there's like uh, you have to leave room for dessert, right? It's kind of the same concept where if you like kind of change something, you end up having more room for that. And if that helps you in your adherence to like eating more food, then by all means, right? Well, because true. in the end, it's more calories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, mean, I, I like having Subway. That's my thing. So I like having Subway, a little bit of vegetables. I know it's like very counterintuitive, but um, a little bit of vegetables, a little bit of meat, uh, and then, you know, like lactose like or uh, cheese, right? And then I have that, and then I start having um, – uh, more solid foods from that point on to help the leverages, right? Like uh, the way I position my belt against my body, um, like hopefully bringing my training or hopefully bringing my competing body weight back up to my training body weight because that's my, the, that's the overarching goal. 
um, and things of that nature. But I guess like the important sequence is uh, liquids, electrolytes, and then, uh, you know, maybe like a scoop away and then move on to solids. Um, and then, uh, and obviously everything has to be relatively easily digestible. And the last thing they should think about is fats and proteins. Um, oh, okay. But that doesn't mean that you can't have those. You know, I think you hit two solid points that aren't even necessarily, it might not be a, a scientific factor studies would do, but you're 100% right. I've heard people be like, well, you should eat this, that, and the other day of. And I'm like, my friend, if I'm nervous and any kind of weird down there, mm. I can't force myself to eat certain things. So yeah. when, you, when you said, eat what you think you can eat, if there's some meat in it, well, that's not, I'm not going to digest that. Yeah, but I'll fucking eat it. And it's not just meat alone. It's in a sandwich. Mm. I'm consuming it. I'm going to use it. The other thing is the feeling in your stomach, if you push out and you feel bigger and you could actually get a little push out against the belt, etc. These are things mm. you're not going to see in a study scientifically, but you're going to feel more comfortable and feel is huge, man. If you feel like if every single calorie you get is liquid and you feel small mm -hmm. and you don't feel the same under the bar, the study might tell you, well, you got all your electrolytes and calories, but the study is not going to tell you, how do you feel when you walk out and you feel small because you're not full, everything's liquid in you, and it's not, like, you're 100% right. There's, there, there's where it's, like, individual. Um, mm -hmm. So there's two good points. I, I know yeah. that, 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 that you just hit up. I'm glad you said that because I wasn't even thinking mm -hmm. along those lines. I, I guess this is my last thing before I leave is um, really, it's not that complicated, guys. Uh, sometimes, like everything that I just discussed here, with whether uh, like the protein that I take uh, after weigh-ins, right? These are all like very small things that you don't necessarily have to implement, especially if you're not cutting that much weight, right? If I cut two to three percent, sometimes what I love doing is not bringing a lot of food in terms of the variety because that puts a lot of stress on mine. I hate carrying bags of food. I hate carrying like bagels there and like bananas there. Rather, sometimes what I do is I have a Pedialyte, put in two tri rolls, drink that. And then I just have a big old gallon thing of uh, naked juice, like the fruit juice. Yeah. And I drink that. And that's it, right? Because it's not that complicated. It isn't. It's a very simple concept. And really, you only have to get into the nuances when you get to, like, specific levels, right? Like, I hate saying that, but, you know, like, ha, ha. Yeah, especially if you're going to get ag aggressive cuts. Um, listen, much appreciated for you stepping in here, Ricky. I know it's freaking Saturday night and you got plans to do uh, so thank you for coming and dude, keep in touch. We're going to have you back. Thank you guys. All right. I'm going to listen to this after you guys finish. So no shit talking. <laughs> yeah. All right. No, no promises. Gonna... I still yeah, owe okay. you for that. I still I'm off to you, Kedrick. Okay. <laughs> That's right. You All know, right. Hey, you know, Kedrick, he's a shit talker, man. Yeah, I can't dude, control I know. I can't control I know. That's why he made this so interesting. <laughs> That's right, man. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's going to trash talk you. Sorry. Oh. Oh, anyway, thank you for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Um, and hopefully we can do this again. This was like an awesome talk. Uh, I thought it was really fun. 100%. I mean, we'll have you back again. Yeah, all right. All right, sounds good. Peace. The villain is out. Yeah. And Kendrick, um, all right. So let's talk about some of your uh, rehydration, rehydration and refreed protocols after somebody's made weight. All right. So can you actually hear me? I can, man. And you know what? I'm, it might even sound a little better. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, okay, so I, I think the first thing we, we have to consider is, uh, I mean, you have to brief me later because I didn't, I don't know what happened to my OC, so I don't want to make conjecture based on the situation that I don't know. So you got to brief me on what happened later. Yeah. But uh, I, I think R Ricky, Ricky got it right in the sense that the first 20 minutes, uh, I would abstain from having solid foods. So I would focus on fluids and electrolytes. And I would even say that that fluid could include like Lucozade or Powerade or Gatorade, whatever your carbohydrate sports drink is, right? So we can get the carbohydrates in uh, early. And this is only, uh, this is much more important if you actually go into, you go into the meat on an empty stomach after a fast and after all kinds of dehydration protocol, right? So you, you brought up a really good point that Sometimes when you feel unstoppable and you feel great under the bar and that is what all, that is the thing that matters a lot. And I absolutely agree because uh, contrary to what Taylor had said on your, your podcast, he said, oh, this time you're going to do a water load and a water cut. For Ron Nationals, he didn't do it at all. Not because he, not, not because he lied and tried to throw, throw off uh, the rest of the guys, but we made the, 
like he and I we made the executive decision not to because I felt like he, he didn't need to. All he need was to pass, you know. And and I think that is something that powerlifters uh, can't allow to get into their heads. Is that oh, my, I, I have an athlete asking me, I'm eighty two point seven kilos. Uh, sorry, I'm eighty three point seven kilos. Right? What do I do? Uh, to weigh in, do I need to do a water load? Like, dude, it's 700 grams, you know? Just yeah. don't eat for 12 hours. You make weight easy, you know? Yeah. Uh, you don't have to stress, you know? Things like that. So, uh, but yeah, sorry to digress, but coming back to, to the the main question is that if you walk in on an empty stomach after uh, water loading, water cutting, whatever dehydration protocol, it is absolutely essential for the first 20 minutes to replenish uh, and rehydrate your fluids with electrolytes first. Right, the exact ratio, I did not know. And to be honest, I'm not talking trash about Ricky about and when he's gone. But no, I let's talk trash about him now. We can talk trash. He's yeah, gone. yeah. <laughs> I, I, that didn't take I, long. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope he doesn't get salty. But I don't manipulate sodium, right? Oh, nicely yeah. done! Wow, the yeah. wordplay, my friend. Nicely done. Yeah. The, the the reason why I don't manipulate sodium so much is because. The potassium and uh, sodium, or like the electrolyte balance in our body, is so tightly regulated that to actually think that we can hit it, hit the correct amount, I think is quite illusory. Uh, based on the fact that it's so tightly regulated, and there are actually studies that show that uh, when they just sample populations that have higher sodium intake, they do not necessarily have higher urinary output, right? So they don't actually reduce, like they don't actually pee more, you know. Uh, but well, obviously, you have to take into account that that population is not doing a water loading protocol. This is just day to day, like Asian countries, right? We we tend to have more salty food, so things like that. And I find that it's just so tightly uh, uh, regulated that sometimes if you have like the risk to reward ratio ratio is much uh, higher, right? If you miss it, your body could sense like a change and it could retain more water because at the end of the day, the sodium potassium like. Besides the other functions, it helps mark to it helps signal like other hormones as well, uh, like aldosterone and stuff like that to actually uh, retain water. So you might cut your sodium out, but if it's too low, uh, from your, what you load, you might actually retain more water. So I'm saying uh, it's a conjecture. I'm not saying it will be, but I say it can happen. You no, know? so I I don't manipulate sodium. So, but I still think uh, it's important to have your electrolytes in because you're dehydrated. So I would just say like. Uh, what what Ricky has mentioned, you know, PDLI uh, with your with your like uh, try oral and stuff like that. Just just have it for the first twenty minutes, and then only after twenty minutes, uh, you can have some form of solid food. The reason because is that you want to, in a way, facilitate gastric emptying, which means that you want whatever you're drinking to really like rehydrate your your body instead of like eating food and then slowing down the rate of gastric emptying, uh, which could potentially impact the rate of dehydration. So when it comes to foods, I do not have specific foods that I would recommend, but I would just say whatever you usually take as your pre-workout meal and you feel great, doesn't upset your tummy, and you find that it's easy to prepare and easy to carry around, yeah, just have it, you know? Because at the end of the day, the more familiar the food is to the athlete, the better it is because that the chances of it upsetting some uh, the athlete is lower. So like, for example, like Taylor Edwards is... Taylor, like, he loves to have, like, oats, right? So, and he said, oh, can I have my oats? It's what I always have uh, pre-workout. I said, yeah, sure. But the only thing that you have to do is that uh, you have to ensure that the first 20 minutes you don't eat the solid food. After the first 20 minutes is done, you can have your oats in small amounts. When it comes to exact food amount, I would say uh, the notion, right? I think that there used to be, be there used to, uh, there's this notion, I think it was popularized by JP, JP Kauchi, Australia, it is that you have to eat and stuff yourself so that your body weight is as close or even heavier than what you usually weigh. And I think that that, that isn't really uh, a good, it's not good advice. I mean, you mentioned that, yeah, you do feel uh, like your belt feels tighter, but there's also a point where, oh my gosh, my, my belt is too tight. And there's all the food in my stomach and I brace, I feel like that belt is pressing the food out of my mouth. Yeah. Right? Uh, I, 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 and that can actually happen as well. And the thing is with our digestive system, once you start exercising, blood from our gut gets drawn out to our muscle, which means our digestion rate slows down even more. Like, for all you know, whatever you had at, uh, after weigh-in, 
might still be in your gut after the meat has ended, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I would think that uh, having ample, ample, or maybe not ample, like sufficient amount of carbohydrates is important, uh, but you don't have to stop yourself to the point where you feel like you're gonna, you're gonna gag and just throw everything out, uh, throw everything out from your mouth. And when it comes to like protein, Ricky mentioned the study and we had exchanged this exchange before. I said, Ricky and I, we chat uh, uh, once in a while and it's, it's always simple. So no trash talking in the chat. So I'm gonna do it all, all here, right? Yeah. So uh, he mentioned he has whey protein, but the, the, the studies that he met, there were three others, there were three studies done in like sequence. It's probably for that researcher's PhD because that's the, that's usually how it is, right? You research a similar team. But what they found was that uh, the only study, and Ricky did mention this, he said one study, right? So I'm literally talking about the study that he, he talked about. They used uh, milk protein instead of whey protein. And the authors postulated that the effect was actually uh, due to a delayed gastric emptying. So because milk protein is 80% casein and 20% whey, and casein actually curdles in the gut, so that could slow down gastric emptying. So that potentially could have led to like more sustained like dehydration. And then at the time when they test, right? Because everything is very time point dependent. So when the, at the time they test, the group that had milk protein might show that they were potentially more rehydrated. But they the same group did two other studies and they used when they used whey protein, they found no difference. Mm. Maybe because whey protein is uh, like I say, it doesn't uh, clot in your gut and it's much more uh, rapidly digest. And the authors even said in the milk protein study that, that the, the mechanisms are unknown, but this is what we feel. It could be due to the, the casein in the milk protein clotting, slowing gastric emptying, but it wasn't tested for, so it's just conjecture at this point of time. So I feel... Hey, you're right. back. Yeah. New, New Zealand Wi-Fi, not, not the greatest place. <laughs> no yeah. what, what was the last thing you, you I uh, said? We're, we're talking about that protein, but um, in terms yeah. of there, there wasn't a whole lot of science behind it. But um, essentially, it's more important what I'm gathering from this to rehydrate and eat as you would normally eat. Um, I had a quick question I wanted to double back because you had said fasting and you had mentioned 12 hours. How much of a fast is too much of a fast? If, if someone doesn't fast in their day to day yep. and they fast to, to drop a little bit of weight so they have no calories going in, will it impact how much is too much where it might impact their performance because they have two hours to eat and then it becomes a situation where if you don't normally fast and then you eat after you weigh in, you really got, you have to change the foods you eat to make sure you digest it because your normal foods you eat might not be quick foods you normally digest, but on the flip side, you don't actually don't normally fast 12 hours either. So, cause you, um, yeah, I could see a scenario where someone might fast, not have any, any calories, and then they decide after they weigh in, what they normally eat isn't something they eat that they're gonna digest very quickly. So by the time they're squatting, they're running low on calories, more so than they would normally be. And that's when you're like, oh shit, I don't feel my usual self. Have you run into that? Or? Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, like the, 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 the time cost of fasting, from what I noticed is that for most people, 14 hours seems to be a good amount. Usually I just get them to 12, but if they're slightly heavy, maybe the extra two hours will help. I find like anything more than that is a psychological battle for them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it affects the psychology more than the physiology because when it comes down to the weigh in and stuff, like I honestly think that, uh, what, however, like hype they'll get, they'll probably just, like overcome whatever, uh, like the hunger, you know, the, all that kind of stuff, uh, or how they feel. What, what about potentially calories? Be... What about calories as the fuel, though? Not necessarily hunger, but um, you have less calories in the body for ener converting to energy. Um, is will they be able to get those calories back in after they weigh in if they have that twelve-hour gap? Yeah, I, I think when we look at it from calories, I don't think we look at it as a vacuum as calories a day, you know, I, because like I said, our body has reserve stores of like fat stores, like glycogen stores and stuff. So I don't think that the body would be deprived, especially within that short period of time. And if we look at, I, I always say what, whatever you're eating right now, post weighing, it's not for your squat, you know, it might play an extent, but it will just help you last longer in the meat because 
a meet can be long. It's like three hours long, yeah. you know. So I would say that if you don't, if maybe if you just have like just like a Gatorade, you might actually do it well in the squat. But when it comes to bench and it comes to deadlift, you might actually start feeling like crap because yeah. that that there is nothing there. So I would say that when people the calories on its own as Looking because I mean calories technically is like a measurement of energy, but it doesn't really play such a big role in such a short time frame. Uh, when we when we look at not, I mean it goes back to the question like when you look at not cutting calories throughout like the the day you weight cut uh, the week you weight cut it's like over an extended period of time, so that could be a bigger factor. But I think when it comes to the weigh-ins and like the fast, I don't feel like it plays such a big role, especially if you can uh, hit the rehydration and. Uh, recovery strategies right after your weigh-ins. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, so to summarize some of this, um, in terms of a protocol for some people, essentially what you want to do is a good healthy cut is between, is it 3 to 5% body weight you had said, roughly? Yep. Uh, I would say 3 to 5% body weight, right? That, 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 that is a relatively decent cut that most uh, like powerlifters do. Uh, when I look at my survey data that I had, roughly 4%, right, at least from the world level, 4% seems to be the sweet spot. Uh, obviously, the lower you can be, the better, right? Some people would just like to push the limits as much as they, as just because they can, and I, don't, I do not recommend that. Mm. Uh, just for the sake of it, do yeah. not push the limits, you know? I would say, yeah, 4% should be a sweet spot. Not, not, nothing much to worry about. Especially when you're starting. Uh, figure out how your yes. body responds to 4 and then you could go slightly more or whatever, but like have a baseline between there. And then roughly how far out would you say they should start water loading? How many days out would you say? Um, I would with like four days and then the the fifth day is when it's written. The fifth day would be the day that they cut water, which is 24 hours prior to competition. And then you said um, how many liters of water per kilo body weight did you say again? So it's 100, 100 ml per kilo body weight or one liter per 10 kilos, right? So Gotcha. And then that's basically you would maintain that every day of water loading? Uh, yes, for at least three days. The, the data that's in science right now uses three days. But like I say when we start on day one, it's 80% of that amount, just more. So like, yeah, the person doesn't find that water loading too big, right? The number is too large. Like, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. You know, it's more of like a more psychological or yeah. practical thing rather than a science-based thing. Yeah. And if you do more than three to four days, is it just, it's not helping anymore. It's around three to four days is where the sweet spot is. You could do more if you like, but it's actually not going to help or hurt um, if you do more. Is that right? I, yeah, I don't, I, I can't say for sure that it won't help. I, I'm not sure if you can lose more weight or you pee more, but I know for the fact that, I mean, when I say pee more, it's pee more on the last day when you cut water, but I say you will definitely pee more uh, when you drink a lot of water. So for some people where, like imagine your, your job is a pilot, right? I have an athlete where the job's a pilot and never ever want to load them because they can't be going to the toilet every time they fly an aircraft. That yeah. is not, that's bad for him and bad for the people in the aircraft. I mean, you're autopilot and all that kind of stuff, but yeah. he decided against that because of his specific situation. So if you're, if, or if, if you're like a shift worker or like a security guard, dude, if you go to the toilet, like every single time, it's bad for like your job. So I would say that, that, that three to four days is the sweet spot where you can, yeah, sort of like not disrupt your daily life too much. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and in terms of uh, ma- manipulation for sodium, not really for that, but in terms of manipulation that if on the last day um, when you cut the water, you think you're going to also have to sweat, you found that there are some studies where if you train sweating, it's, it's a possibility. However, you win, you, this is more advanced. If you, if you think, look, it, it's more than 3 to 5%, we're looking at 6 to 7% or higher, you're probably going to need heat. Um, and you, it will help. It's more advanced, but it will help to uh, use heat once, one hour, once a week, several times. So the body starts adapting to sweating. However, um, you you were saying if you're going to use heat, do non-active because active depletes the glycogen levels, and um, and that's really not actually going to help much, especially if it's a two-hour weigh-in. And if you're a powerlifter who actually isn't work used to working actively like that. 
you're going to probably impact your performance as well because your central nervous system is not used to being on a bike, um, et cetera. So uh, you would say probably forego that. And then uh, we had a quick discussion. I'm just summarizing this for everybody because we hit a lot of points. And then you were also saying um, that uh, in terms of the last little bit, we were talking about how long to be dehydrated. And we had a bit of a discussion on the period um, did we nail down a period of time that you would say is probably preferable to be dehydrated or is it, is that also individual? I think, I think it's individual, like you said, like, but I mean, when we talk about dehydrated, we said, uh, I think to qualify the statement, we need to say dehydration after a sauna, right? Because obviously yeah. if you're, if you're not taking fluids, that's technically being in a state of dehydration because you're not consuming water. So dehydration after, after a sauna, like you say, you, you, for you, right, you're not going to sleep anyway. Yeah. So let's, let's. Might as well let's use the time of being not able to sleep. Let's use it a little bit more productive, right? Yeah. So, uh, for but on the other hand, Ricky is like, no, I tried it before and it absolutely sucks for me. Uh, not gonna do that. This way works better. Very yeah. individual. Uh, and I would say right now we don't know, which is why uh, it's part of my PhD to study that. Hopefully, we come up with some uh, good data and then you I'll look at like have people fill out like sleep quality questionnaires as well. Yeah. Uh, and then try to try to look at the stats and correlate sleep and and their sleep quality that affects the performance changes or whatever you know hopefully we we get some good data from that uh, but right now I would say that I don't know do whatever you feel like you've been doing for you and you feel comfortable with yeah yeah and I think that's one hundred percent I think that's the other piece where there is straight up if you want to do it and just talk about dehydration that's one piece but. The sleep quality is a whole nother. And when people are like, well, you don't want to be dehydrated too long. On the flip side, for some people like myself, you wait. If you tell me I got to wake up at three o'clock in the morning to do all my cutting so that I'm right before I weigh in at seven, I, and I normally go to sleep at one o'clock, I'm not sleeping that night. And then well, how is that going to impact me? I understand if I cut it the night before, I'm going to be dehydrated longer, but then it becomes that whole what's better to be a little dehydrated and actually sleep or have no sleep and dehydrated. I mean, these are all variables that float around, right? Yeah. One hundred percent. I think, I think I, I, I say this all the time, you know, at the end of the day, whatever science tells you, right. You, 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 you say it as well, right. Uh, there are certain questions that science will not answer. Science will tell you your electrolyte balance, your fluid balance, whatever, how hydrated you are, but because of like the subjective stuff from people, uh, yeah. that, that might not be accounted for in the study, you know? And I, I, I always say this, that science is not, uh, science is not prescriptive. Science is descriptive. So science describes the hows and the whys, but sometimes it doesn't tell you what you ought to do. So what you ought to do is usually based on uh, context, circumstances, uh, your subjective experience with particular intervention. Uh, and you have to really take that into considerations, consideration when you interpret the science. Because at the end of the day, science describes how and why certain things works. And it doesn't tell you exactly what to do, you know? Yeah, oh, 100%. I mean, it's good to say, like, now nah, get up, make sure, if you read a study, it says make sure to dehydrate yourself, like, right before the weigh-ins, three hours before you start your cut. Your weigh-ins at 6 a.m., you're going to wake up at 3 a.m. You never go to sleep before 1 a.m. Okay, you're not sleeping. And then, so, first off, so that just disrupts everything. So you're going to feel sketchy. And then if science said... Well, you could get out all your foods from these liquids or whatever it might might be. You get there that day, you pack all that lunch, whatever it is they tell you to eat. And you're like, man, I can't eat this. I'm too nervous. I can only eat certain foods right now. My stomach's only going to take it in. So like you just said, I mean, science is, it doesn't account for that individuality. You know, like how are you for a sleeper? How are you for forcing yourself? To, man, it's easy to say eat this. It's hard to force Sometimes you're like, I can't eat this right now. If you put this type of food in front of me, I'll, I'll jam it in. But I can't eat such and such. You know, so it's, um, there is, there's something to be said for, you know, catering it to the specific lifter and getting the most out of them. And what makes you feel more full than not over full? What makes you feel strong? Yeah. You know, you're not sketchy as much. I think basically it's close to your normal circumstances for lifting should be achieved if possible. Yes, one 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 hundred percent, and I and I think that uh that, that there is also like research showing that I mean this is combat sports they measure a decrement in performance uh but they can't exactly tell what it is because they did like stuff like peripheral which is like uh 
in muscle function, right? And they test muscle function and it's like, there's no change in muscle function. And they actually look at, uh, so peripheral fatigue is like out of the question. And then they look at CNS fatigue and it's not CNS fatigue as well. So it's like, if it's not that, it's not this, it, well, what it is, but the thing they didn't account for is mental fatigue, yeah. right? So mental fatigue is that it's very hard to account for because it's so subjective, yeah. you know? But having it as close as possible as like what you train, what you feel good during training, uh, that is potentially reducing the mental fatigue aspect of it. And that, that there is like a lot of literature out there, at least uh, a review where they showed that subjective wellness questionnaires are more, much more accurate than whatever objective markers like blood or like HRV or whatever you can do in, in the lab. Like just asking an athlete how they feel is actually potentially much more accurate than that, you know? So uh, that, that is something that's, that, that you said that's really good as well, you know, like the closer you can get how you feel great during a training day, the better it is, which is why I think that it was really good with like Taylor uh, at Wolves this year, especially, I mean, Raw Nationals was great as well, but Raw Nationals, Taylor like had that abductor pain on his mind, but Wolves was just great. We, he woke up, like I said, yeah, you know, he weighed at the weigh-in, while lining up to weigh in, he was drinking his like Gatorade. And that is like, dude, you know, you guys are like not drinking anything at all. I'm like, here, yeah, I'm drinking whatever. You guys, I, I made it. I won the battle. You guys do have to wait, right? Yeah. Like, while that might provide some physiological like benefit of like, hey, uh, get the carbohydrates in early, I think like having that mentality, like, yeah, I've really done it, like, really helps to like set, uh, set a solid base of confidence moving in, you know? Mm -hmm. No, 100%. And for me, one of the hardest things, um, because I'm not a great sleeper, is if people say, like, make sure you get X amount of sleep. And it's like, I'm going to fall asleep when I fall asleep. Like, I always, you know, people like, well, make sure. So if you if your weigh-in is at such and such a time, and you need a minimum seven hours sleep, that means you got to fall asleep by this other time period. And it's like, I man, I can't make myself fall asleep at that time period. So, are you back? I think I lost you for a second there. Yeah, I'm yeah. back. Yeah, uh, I was just saying how um, if you're waiting to a specific time in the morning and they're like, make sure you, you get no less than seven hours sleep. It, that's For me, that's just not an option, man. I can't force myself to fall asleep. It's just not the way she goes. You know what I mean? For some people. So these are other variables where it's like, sense. so these are other variables where it's like, well, make sure you, you do all your cutting the morning of. It's like, then I'm not sleeping, man. They're like, because I'm not falling asleep till specific till late. So if I take any time period in the morning to do any any of that job, it's coming out of my sleep. So this becomes one of these balances. So that's why, I mean, I think, man, we're getting to a point where we got coaches for programming. We got coaches for handling because it's not the same. You can have an amazing programmer and he's not great at handling. You can have an amazing handler. He's not great at programming. And we're starting to get into coaches for nutrition, coaches for weight cutting. And this is like that next level. Yeah. yeah. But uh, listen yeah. – we're at, I mean, a crazy amount of hours, man. I don't know how long we do this, like three hours long. Much appreciated. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. It is Saturday night. I feel like we got to have you back um, because, man, we've done, there's so much to cover on this, especially after you do all these studies. Yeah, 100%. And I, I, I think that there, obviously, we've, we've not got into the trash talk part of my trash talk Michael C, which uh, maybe for another time. Yeah. Uh, and. Yeah. There, there are listeners' questions we have to answer as well, so probably another time as well. And, yeah, I yeah. mean, it, we'd probably have to ask him too. Like, we'd just be guessing though for Michael C. Who knows? Yeah. Like, you, there's so many variables, man. We don't know. It'd be hard for you to yeah. answer, really, because you would have to. You basically have to ha have him answer a questionnaire. It would be thinking you ate, drank, slept to try to figure that out. And it's really too tough to right. tell from a distance. I, yeah, I, I think a big part, right? Just, just on. A note to end is to put always talk about cramping when it comes to uh, like whatever sports, right? But the fact that you, you, you did say like I, I, I like science can't answer everything and science still doesn't know what causes cramps until today. So people say it's electrolytes, people say it's magnesium. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, it's been disproven. But a uh, separate like hypothesis would be it's just it's just a nervous system thing where. Uh, basically, there's interaction between like your go guy uh, tendon and like muscle spindles, and sometimes like you know some nervous system get like it's an inhibition of one of them, so your muscle just contract and doesn't release, and it's purely like a nervous system thing which you cannot really change much regardless of whatever. So for people that usually have cramps, 
uh, they, we call it hyper excitability, you know, so like you get really like, like the muscles just hyper excited, right, and it just contracts and doesn't relax, so that's that, that essentially what cramps are, so I would say for people who have been experiencing cramps out there, I mean, some of the listeners, they ask about cramps, is just that you make sure that you get everything right, like your, your potassium, whatever, your, your dehydration, right, sometimes, you know, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, yeah. you know, you, you just make sure that you get the base covered and I mean, I don't want to say hope for the best, but because like science doesn't show a way that we can actually overcome this right now. So that, that is all I can say, you know, you cannot really change your like nervous system uh, or, or the excitability of your nervous system. So, yeah. Cause there is, I guess like if you're dehydrated, you can cramp up, but you, what you're saying yeah. is, so there is like, all right, if you're dehydrated, you can cramp up, but you can even cramp up if you're hydrated and there's no reason. And I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. Essentially. Yeah, I mean, like we, we we hear about people like cramping up in while they swim, you know, or like yeah. cramping up not because of exercise, or cramping yeah. up just because you stand up, you know. Yeah. So yeah, it's just yeah. like a nervous system thing, and I wouldn't say that. Oh man, this guy like it's regardless of the water load or the water cut, and we still experience cramps, right? So I'd say like there is a potential to cramp when you're dehydrated, but and the potential is bigger, but there is also a potential to cramp when you're completely like yeah. in a normal state. For all you know, like I might cramp up right now. Uh, talking to you on the podcast, but that is probably because Ricky is cursing me right now. Uh, <laughs> and, but and we've been we've been doing this for three hours in the seated position. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, so, yeah. Much appreciated, man. I mean, this has been incredibly informative, and um, I'm definitely excited to see what your studies are going to show. Um, I would love to have you back in 2020 and talk about this again. I'm sure when we drop this, we're going to get a lot of questions as well. Uh, so thank you yeah. for your time. Listen, if people have if they want to reach out to you in terms of coaching, um, in terms of coaching for whatever, whether it's programming or whether it's uh, just water cutting, etc., how do people get a hold of you? I think the best way to reach me is like uh, my Instagram. So it's Kedrick TSG. I'm sure you, you'll probably like tag me and link that, whatever. Uh, and my email is Kedrick at the Strength Guys. Uh, or you can actually go to like the inquiry page for the Strength Guys and just say, hey, you know, I want to work with Kedrick. I've heard the podcast. And just, yeah, just say, I want to work with Kedrick based on this, this, this. And usually they refer that those athletes to me. But if you want to personally reach me, if you have, even if the listeners have questions that they find that uh, I wasn't clear in this podcast, just shoot me a message on Instagram. I'm quite, I'm quite active there. So, yeah, I would say Instagram is the best way to reach me. Bam. There you go. Listen, my man, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Um, and we will keep in touch, sir. Definitely a pleasure to be on. Thank you for having me. And great discussion. Really enjoyed it. Good time, man. Talk to you later. All right. See ya. There it is, man. Um, I'm sorry if the audio wasn't amazing early on. Uh, my man's microphone wasn't great. Eventually ditched it. And uh, he tried ditching it before, and it wasn't working. He ditched it the second time, and the audio was bang on. Um, I think it's going to be a lot easier on the YouTube to figure out when you're seeing somebody. But I'll try to jig it and see what we can get in terms of his audio. Nonetheless... Um, pretty informative stuff. I mean, water cutting really is a huge part if you're in a weight class sport. But I do think, and they hit the nail on the head there, don't worry about water cutting. Unless you're, you're, you got a major goal like qualifying for something or a record's in place, until that time, lift in the weight class you're in and don't worry about it. I think we covered it all. If we have any questions, please do shoot them to us subscribe, give us high ratings on all your platforms, help our ranking in terms of the podcast from Six Pack Lapidat. Until next time.